Hello everyone. Good morning. Am I clearly visible, audible to you guys? Samim, uh, Ahmed, anyone can respond if I am clearly visible, audible. We can go ahead. I guess I am clearly visible, audible. We shall start the class. Okay. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Osama. Good morning, Ahmed. Everyone. So let's start it. So I welcome you all for today's session. Today we are going to continue a series, a very interesting series which we have started last time that is oncology series. So in the last session I have already briefed all the important points regarding the general oncology. Overview of the oncology we have already seen what are the uh, proto-oncogene, tumor suppressor genes, the molecular basis of uh, oncology and what is neoplasia, the nomenclature, the benign, the malignant tumor, the differences between them, the metastasis, the steps in metastasis. We have covered all these things already in the last session I guess right now it's time to start systemic oncology I mean step by step one by one we will take the tumors and see its detail okay so are you people ready can we go ahead are you people ready so let's start oncology series okay so in the oncology series there are many tumors from head to toe we are going to cover. So it will take two, three more episodes. Okay, so today what I have decided to cover these tumors. I will start first of all with the breast tumor, which is ultra important from exam point of view. Whatever exam you are targeting for, is it need PG, is it FMG, is it USMLE? It will be a very important question. You get many questions from breast cancer. Okay, so we will be covering all the breast tumors, the benign as well as malignant. After that, we will be covering on the tumors of the brain, the CNS. Okay, the primary tumors of the uh, central nervous system after that we will be covering the thyroid tumors ultra important then we will we will be coming on hemato oncology in which we are going to cover all the leukemias as well as lymphomas and then tumors of kidney and the liver tumors so this is the section which is which is decided for today okay so yes yes definitely Ahmad, i will try to keep the speed in balance so that you can get it so can we start are you people ready can we start the marathon for today we will be starting with breast tumor. You like the strategy? In this sequence, we are going to take the tumor. After that, many more tumors are there. All the bone tumors, all the genital tumors, and a panis tumor, ovary tumor, prostate tumor in the male, ovary tumor, and a uterus tumor in the female we are having. So all these tumors I have decided for the next time. Right, right. Whatever is left, we will take in the next episode. Uh, soon we will plan next episode also. But this is for this episode. These are the tumors we are going to cover in the next 3-4 hours. Okay, so give me a minute. Let me open the chat. Yes, thank you so much. So let's start it. Let me start with the breast tumors. Can I start with breast tumors? Can we go ahead with the breast tumors? Okay, so before understanding the benign tumors as well as malignant tumors of the breast, it's very important to understand the normal structure of the breast. If you can understand the normal structure of a female breast, then only you can understand the tumors well. You will, you will have a better orientation of the morphology of the tumors if you know the structure of the breast. Okay, so let me first tell you the structure of a female breast. Right, what is breast? Breast is the modified skin appendage. Okay, it is functional during in females during lactation for the breastfeeding to the baby only, right? But in males throughout the life, it's rudimentary organ. It's a rudimentary organ in males, right? Now, breast tumor, the malignant tumor, which I'm going to teach you today, it is more common in females, although can occur in males also, but it's very rare in male. The ratio is 150 is to 1. So, every 150 female, there is one male in which the breast cancer can occur. Okay, so let me tell you first, first the uh, uh, structure of a normal breast. Okay, so let, let's see the structure. Now, you can see this is the female breast in front of you I have drawn. If you can understand this structure, if you can understand what is TDLU, the functional unit, unit of the breast, then, then the understanding the morphology, the microscopy of the benign and malignant tumor will be super easy for you, right? So rather than showing you here, let me draw it for you. So let me draw the diagram of a female breast, not male breast. Okay, here we can see I am drawing the female breast. This is the nipple portion. Now in the breast, the female breast, there are two components, the epithelial component and the stromal component. Let me tell you what is epithelial component. The epithelial component is in the form of the small ductules. Can you see? These all are ductules. These all are small ductules, you can see. Okay, these are in the form of the glands. Okay, now they all... All the small ductules, they will end in terminal ducts. These all are terminal ducts connecting them. They open in the terminal ducts. 
okay these all are terminal ducts you can see now multiple terminal duct open in the lacticiferous duct which open in the nipple okay these all terminal ducts they open in the lacticiferous duct can you see they combine together and they open in the lacticiferous duct this is lacticiferous duct and ultimately the lacticiferous duct open in the uh, nipple you can see just below the nipple there is a dilatation in the lacticiferous duct which is known as lacticiferous sinus okay now this structure in the breast it is known as tdlu that is terminal duct lobular unit this is the functional unit of the breast like the glomerulus is the functional unit in the kidney the acna is the functional unit in the lung so what is the functional unit in the breast it is tdlu okay now what is the function of the breast as i told you in females it is functional only during lactation to feed the baby to breastfeed the baby so inside the milk inside the breast two things happen the milk synthesis the breast milk synthesis and its ejection into the mouth of the baby okay so two things happen so where does the milk get synthesized let me draw it let me show you so here the milk is synthesized by the cells of the ductules can you see the cells of the ductules they synthesize the milk in the lumen there is milk the breast milk synthesis takes place okay now after that the milk will come in the terminal duct and it will come in the lacticiferous duct and it will get stored in the sinus in the lacticiferous sinus now whenever the baby suck the nipple of the mother at that time the milk will eject it into the mouth of the baby so this is the function of the breast you can see the structure you can see the function now the most important thing this is all epithelial component can you see the background the background let me draw the background let me show you the background the background is known as stroma you got my point what i am saying can you see the complete background the background is known as stroma apart from the epithelial component the epithelial component is only 10 percent the maximum 90 percent is the stroma you can see the stroma in the background okay the stroma is made up of number one fat it contains abundant of fat and it contains abundant of uh, fibrous tissue so fibrous and uh, fibrous tissue and the fat is present in the stroma you got the normal structure if you got the normal structure let me come on the tumors you got what is normal structure so this is the normal structure of the breast as i told you and each breast is divided into multiple small small lobes 20 lobes or approximately 15 to 20 lobes are there okay so this is the same structure shown to you you can see this is pectoralis mu muscle this is the pectoralis muscle you can see this is the breast this is the nipple now inside the breast you all can see these are the ductules as i told you these all are ductules can you see these all are ductules and these are the terminal ducts can you see these all are terminal ducts now they all are opening in the lacticiferous duct lacticiferous duct carry the milk which is synthesized into the ductules to the nipple and it's stored in the lacticiferous sinus and finally it is ejected in the nipple so same diagram shown to you now you can see the background the background is the stroma you got my point the background can you see the yellow colored background i want you to appreciate this this is stroma this is complete stroma okay now this is complete stroma now let me give you one more concept of lobule what is a lobule in a breast you must understand because i want to teach you lobular carcinoma if you don't understand what is lobule how you will understand what is lobular carcinoma you got my point so what is a lobule in a breast now as i told you there is tdlu these are the ductules let me draw a few ductules they all open in tdlu this is a tdlu okay this is one tdlu containing multiple ductules so if i take three to five tdlu i am saying three to five tdlu terminal ducts so all the appendages arising from that it constitute one lobule let me draw let me draw three tdlu for you let me draw three terminal ducts for you this is one two three three terminal ducts i'm i'm drawing now all the ductules arising from it and all uh, the uh, ductules as well as uh, ducts arising from that they will constitute one lobule you can see this is all one lobule so in one lobule it is the multiple ductules we are having so i am saying what i am saying three to five terminal ducts you can see one two three and all the appendages arising from that constitute one lobule if you got what is the what is the concept behind the one lobule it's very easy for you to understand the lobular carcinoma can i can i proceed you got it everyone with me say something everyone is with me can we proceed ahead give me a minute you can see the breast is divided into 20 lobes now inside the lobes there are multiple lobules inside the lobules there are multiple ductules right ductules open in the terminal ducts this constitute tdlu and they all open in lacticiferous duct just before the lacticiferous duct there is lacticiferous sinus okay you got the structure now let me tell you the lining of the tdlu as i have shown you this complete structure what is the lining of the epithelial component this 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 i'm marking with red color what is the lining over here what is the lining 
So if you talk about the lining, there is double lining. In the breast, there is always bilayer, double lining in entire epithelial component. So inner is epithelial, outer is myoepithelial. Let me show you. Can you see here this? Appreciate these ductules. Appreciate. Okay. Now, if you zoom any one of this, you can see. You can see the inner is the epithelial component. This one. The complete. And you can appreciate the outer. I want you to appreciate this outer flattened cell. These all are myoepithelial cells. These all are myoepithelial cells. You can see one of the ductule. Let me zoom it out. You can see this one. You can see the epithelial component. One of the ductule. And appreciate the outer myoepithelial component. The flattened myoepithelial component. This one. Can you appreciate? So, this is bilayered. So, complete epithelial component is bilayered. Let's start the tumors. So, let's start the tumors in the breast, the stromal tumors. So, first I am going to teach you the stromal tumors, then I am going to teach you the epithelial tumors. I told you there are two components. The background, can you see the complete background that is stroma. So, let me teach you two stromal tumors that, is, that are benign tumors of the breast, fibroadenoma and phylloid tumor. So, let me teach you what is fibroadenoma, let me teach you what is phylloid tumor, then I will be covering on the coming on the epithelial tumors that is the main breast carcinoma, the adenocarcinoma of the breast. We will be coming on that after covering the stromal tumors of the breast. Are you people there? Can we go ahead? Okay. Okay. Can we go ahead? Yes. Can we proceed? Okay. Yes. So, let me continue with the stromal tumors of the breast. I am going to cover two tumors here, the fibroadenoma and the phylloid tumor. So, let's start with fibroadenoma. Please understand very carefully. Fibroadenoma is the most common benign tumor in the females in the breast. Most common benign tumor of the breast is fibroadenoma. It occurs in relatively younger age, that is 15 to 30 years of age. It's always single, solitary, it's discrete and it's freely mobile since it's benign. You can see in this breast, the female breast, you can see, you can see there is a tumor. This one, it's solitary, it's freely mobile, it can be in any quadrant of the breast. This is fibroadenoma. This one is fibroadenoma. You got it? This one is fibroadenoma. Grossly, if you if you take it, do the surgery and take it out, the surgeon is taking the tumor out, it's small. The size is 2 to 4 or maximum 2 to 5 centimeter. Hardly, rarely. Rare of the rarest, they can be more than 5 centimeter. They are very small, 2 to 5 centimeter. They are always solitary, single. They are well encapsulated. You can make out the boundary and there is a capsule over it. I know you have to differentiate the phyloids and the fibroadenoma. Please understand. In phy phyloids, everything will be opposite. This one is small, that one be will be large. This is solitary, that is usually multiple. Here, capsule is present. There is no capsule is present. No circums uh, circumscribed tumor is there. And you can see this is the gross. Can you see this is the gross? You can see this is fibroadenoma. I am telling you the gross of the fibroadenoma. Make out the margins. This is the boundary. You can see it is covered by a capsule. Well circumscribed, capsulated tumor. What else you can see? You can see the slit-like spaces. What are all these? These are the slit, slit, compressed spaces between the tumor. Why they appear? I will tell you the reason in the microscopy. Don't worry. So, this is the gross. Okay. Coming, you can see the gross here also. Appreciate the capsule. Appreci appreciate the circle. Well circumscribed and appreciate the slit-like spaces. The slit-like spaces is a hallmark. It can come in the form of an image-based question. Spotter image in your exam. The image will be given to you and some clinical history you can identify. It's a typical image of fibroadenoma because of three things. Number one, it is well circumscribed. Number two, it is capsulated. Number three, I can see the most important slit-like spaces inside that. Got it? The slit-like spaces is very important. Coming on microscopy, what if I make the slide of this? What you will get in the slide? What you will get in the slide? So, in the slide, in the microscopy, there are two patterns. There are two types of fibroadenoma you can see. Intracanalicular and pericanalicular. What are the two types? intracanalicular and pericanalicular. Let me explain. You can see this is the normal breast. This is normal. Huh? This is normal. I am not teaching you. This is not tumor. This one is normal. You all can see. In the normal I taught you know there is double lining. You can see this is all epithelial cell you can see and this is fibro, fibro, uh, myoepithelial cells I mean outer. So, this is the normal breast. Now, this is intracanalicular. You may be thinking ma'am the ductules are there. We can see the lumen of the ductule normally. There are many ductules. We can see the lumen here, lumen here, lumen here, lumen here. But where does the lumen disappear here? Here lumens are disappeared. Where are the lumens? Actually, the ducts are get compressed. You can imagine this is a ductule. Okay. It is lined by double, double lining. Anna? You can see this is epithelial and this is myoepithelial. Okay. This is double lining. And what, what, what I am telling you, I am not interested in the epithelial component right now. I am interested in the stromal component appreciate the background the yellow stroma 
Now this in fibroadenoma, this yellow stroma get abundant. There is abundant of stroma that is compressing the gland. The gland get compressed. The lumen get disappear. Mind my words. I know because it is abundant of uh, stroma. I know the fatty stroma, the fibrous stroma. So abundant of fibrous stroma is there. That is the problem in fibroadenoma. That is the word fibro. Fibro means abundant of fibrous stroma. It's a stromal tumor. So what will happen? It will result in slit-like appearance of the gland. The gland get compressed. There is no lumen. It get compressed like that. And what you see all around? What you see all around is the stroma, 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 stroma. That is compressing the gland. So the gland get compressed and we can see multiple slit-like spaces. The lumen get disappeared and it get converted into slit-like spaces. That is the hallmark of the fibroadenoma. Now oh, I hope you got it that uh, why we see the slit-like spaces in gross also. So in gross also we have the slit-like spaces. You can appreciate the slit. These are the glands which get compressed by the around surrounding stroma. And in the microscopy also I can see the slit-like spaces. I want you to appreciate the slit. This is a slit. This is a slit. This is a slit. All these are the slits I am highlighting. You can see the slits. And see the background that is compressing the slit. From all the sides the compression is there. You can see they all are compressing. So abundant of stroma is there. The stroma is compressing the dirt, dirt, their lumen get disappeared and slit-like clefts are formed which are, which are lined by the ductal epithelium. So, this is intracanalicular pattern. Now, coming on the pericanalicular pattern. Okay, this is intracanalicular fibroadenoma. Coming on the second uh, type of, uh, coming on the second type of uh, fibroadenoma that is pericanalicular. In the pericanalicular also, you can see these are the ductules. Okay, these are the ductules. Here also we can see the background stroma. So, background stroma um, increases here also, here also. But here the background stroma was compressing. It was compressing the ductules so they get, get compressed and slit-like spaces are formed. Here it is pulling. You got my point? Please understand the difference between push and pull. Here it was pushing type of stroma. Here it is pulling. The stroma is pulling. So, instead it get compressed, its lumen get dilated. So, you get the dilated ducts here. You got my point? You get the dilated ducts here. Say yes if you got it. How many of you got it? This is pericanalicular. So here, here also abundant of fibrous stroma is there. But it is encircling around the ducts and it's it's pushing. I'm sorry. It's pulling the ducts so that it become patent and dilated. Let me draw three diagrams for you. Everyone here on the screen. You can see the normal ducts here. You can see the normal duct. Or let me draw one, one only. This is a normal duct. Here it get compressed. Here it get dilated. Okay. Now, let me draw the stroma everywhere. So, here also I am drawing the stroma, surrounding stroma. This is normal I am drawing. Here also I try to draw the surrounding stroma. I am trying to draw the surrounding stroma here also. And here also I am trying to draw the surrounding stroma. So, what is the problem? What is the problem? This one is normal. Okay. Normally, there are ductules surrounded by stroma. Here also stroma increases. Here also stroma increases. So, both of them, the both type of the fibroadenoma, these are stromal hyperplasia. There is hyperplasia on the stroma. The stromal cells get abundant. But here it's pushing type. The stroma is pushing. And here it's pulling type. The stroma is pulling. Please understand the difference between pushing and pulling. Look at the arrows. You will get it. This is pushing type and this is pulling type. You can understand. Pushing and pulling. So here you can see the lumen get compressed and slits are formed. And here you can see the lumen get dilated. So here the ducts are dilated. How many of you got it? So these are the two types of these are the two types of fibroadenoma. This one you can see the what are the name of the two types? Can you tell me the name of the two types? This is in this one is pericanalicular, this is intracanalicular. Give me a second. There is power cut off and the inverter is making noise. You have to give me a one minute to fix it. Just a second. I'm sorry. So, how many of you got it? How many of you got it? Okay. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Huh? So, this is the two types of the fibroadenoma. Anyone having any doubt, you can write down in the chat. What you are asking me now? Is it possible to change the time for subsequent times? Because it's midnight. You can watch it later on, Meena. And the recording will always be available on the YouTube. Uh, but currently, it's a live session. So, it will be continued as live only. Okay. Can we go ahead? Anyone having any doubt here? The two types of the fibroadenoma I taught you. Can you compare the two types of fibroadenoma? Both of them are in front of you. Can you tell me what are the two types of the fibroadenoma? Intracanalicular and pericanalicular. The two types of fibroadenoma. 
So what is the basic problem in fibroadenoma? Can you tell me? It's a breast tumor. It's a benign tumor of the breast. There is stromal hyperplasia. The stroma get hyper hyperplasia. It's not epithelial component which gets hyperplasia. It's the stroma which get hyperplasia. So in both of them, the background is abundant. In one of them, it's pushing type. In one of them, it's pulling type. You can see here it's pushing, compressing the ducts. Here it's pulling, dilating the ducts. So in one of them, the ducts get compressed. In one of them, the ducts get dilated. I hope you all got it, the two type of the fibroadenoma. You get questions on the morphology. These will be the spotter image. Now this image given to you or this image given to you. Usually more common is intracanalicular. So if you are getting this image, it's a spotter image. Looking at the microscopy, you can say it's a spotter, it's fibroadenoma. You got it? You usually get... Um, uh, you usually get questions on them, the image-based question. Yes, it is the most common uh, benign tumor in the breast. Absolutely right. So can we go on the second stromal tumor? The second stromal tumor is known as phyloids tumor. What do you mean by phyloids? The term phyloids means leaf. Have you seen leaf in the plant? What is the, what is the shape of a leaf? It's something like that. So here the tumor is like leaf only. You know, the tumor is like leaf. That's why it is known as phyloids. The meaning of the phyloids is the leaf-like. Now, please see the difference. The fibroadenoma was in um, a young female. This one is relatively old female, 30 to 70 year. Okay, that was in young female. Uh, the fibroadenoma is always benign. This can be benign, but borderline and malignant are also possible. Okay, grossly, um, I told you the fibroadenoma is small, 2 to 5 centimeter. It is usually large, 10 to 15 centimeter, right? Fibroadenoma was fully encapsulated. This is partially encapsulated. Fibroadenoma was uh, round to oval. With well circumcision, here well circumcision is not there. And the cut surface, here show areas of hemorrhage, necrosis, degenerative changes are common here. So both of them are benign. Both of them are uh, stromal tumors. But there are few differences between fibroadenoma and phylloid. You can see the diagram of the phylloid. You can see here also circumcision is there. We can make out. But capsule is not very uniform and you can make it out. Right. And uh, this is the cut surface of the phylloids. Now let me tell you microscopy. In the microscopy, I told you the meaning of the phylloids. Phylloid means leaf-like, typically leaf-like. This is the diagram. Can you make out the leaves? Where are the leaves? Let me tell you. Let me highlight the leaves for you. Can you see this? This one is looking like a leaf. Yes or no? Say, say something. Can you see these all are looking like leaves? Small, small leaves. So that's why, that is the meaning of the fibroadenoma. You make out. The diagram is looking like leaves. So this is the leaf-like appearance. That's why it is known as fibroadenoma. Now, the point is why it is leaf-like appearance. We know the normal breast. How the normal breast get converted here? What is the problem? The problem is not in epithelia. Again, the problem is in the background only. By background, I mean stroma. Again, it's a stromal hyperplasia. Like fibroadenoma only. Like fibroadenoma only, here is also there is stromal hyperplasia. So, stroma is getting hyperplastic and it is compressing the ducts again here and they become slit-like and they become leaf-shaped. You know, you may be thinking, ma'am, then what is the difference between fibroadenoma and uh, the intracanalicular fibroadenoma? There also we get the slit-like spaces. In phyloids also I am saying the same. There are slit-like spaces taking the shape of the leaf. Here, stromal hyperplasia is much more as compared to fibroadenoma. That is the only difference. Here, stroma is more aggressive, more hyperplastic as compared to fibroadenoma. Rest of the things are same here. You can see what I have marked with red color now. These are the compressed ducts. And what you can see taking the shape of the leaf, that is stroma. So here also we have stromal hyperplasia. You can see these are the ducts which get compressed and taking the margins of the leaf. So here also we have the same thing. Got it? Got it? So here there are three type of phylloid tumor. Benign, borderline, malignant. What is the basis? Fibrotinoma is always benign. But the phylloids can be benign, borderline, malignant depending on the mitosis. How many mitosis you get in the stroma. So you have to look for the mitosis here. Can you self see the cells in the stroma? These all are all small, 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 small cells. So you have to see the pleomorphism in the cells of the stroma and count the mitosis per high power field. If less than 5 mitosis, it's benign. 5 to 10 mitosis, it's borderline. And more than 10 mitosis per high power field, it's malignant. The most important thing to differentiate benign, borderline, malignant is the mitosis in the cells. So we are done, finally landing with two type of stromal tumors of the breast. And now these are the benign tumors. Now I will be coming on the main breast cancer. We say breast cancer, I mean it's adenocarcinoma of the breast. I will be starting that. But before that, we have to finish this. Okay. So, these are the benign tumors. Hana? Fibroadenoma and phylloids, the stromal tumors. Now, I will be covering the epithelial tumors, the main breast cancer. Okay. I told you the, uh, the fibroadenoma occurs in young female, 20 to 30. Phylloid occur in usually old age, 50 to 80 years. Okay. 
Fibrodinoma are small, 2 to 3 centimeters. These one are large, usually more than 5 centimeter. Okay, both are firm, both are painless. Okay, and uh, this one is more circumscribed. This one is less circumscribed. This one is capsule present. This one capsule partially present. Okay, here also stromal hyperplasia, but here stromal abundant hyperplasia. More cellular, more pleomorphic, more mitotic. Right. So, here we have two types, intracanalicular, pericanalicular. Here we have three types, benign, borderline, malignant. I hope you all got it. I hope you all got it. Okay. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Huh? So, no, it will not be only pink for you. You will also understand. Okay. Uh, Dr. Matriot, you will also understand. So, give me, give me some time. At the end, let me finish breast cancer, maybe 15-20 minutes more. You will become an expert to answer any question based on the breast cancer. Okay, let me start breast carcinoma, the malignant cancer now, the main breast cancer, the main breast carcinoma. It's an adenocarcinoma. So, I will be covering everything about that, starting from the introduction, its clinical feature, its triple technique to diagnosis, the risk factors, ultra important. That is known as etiology of the tumor. Its classification, ultra important. The microscopy of all the important tumors in the classification. The molecular classification, that is a recent uh, classification we use. And there are many questions, believe me, from molecular classification. And after that, the grading and the staging. There is a difference between grading and staging. Grades are always four. Stages are also four. But there is a difference between them. So, we will be covering all one by one. Okay. Okay. So, let's start with the breast cancer. Yes, definitely, Varun. I will be covering all the malignancies. I have started with breast cancer. After that, I am going to the brain tumors and after that, I am going to the thyroid, then liver, kidney. So, that is the plan for today. One by one, we will be covering all the important tumors, but main thing with, will be the pathology of the tumor. Okay. So, let's start with the breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most common tumor in the females in the world. In the world, in human, in females, the most common tumor is the breast, female, breast cancer. Anna? And in the males, the most common tumor is the lung cancer. Okay. In the females, it's breast. I'm talking in the world. Hana, in India, it will be different. In India, in females, the most common is cervix. And in males, it is oral cancer. Right. But in the world, if you talk, the females, the most common cancer is always breast. In males, the breast cancer is very rare. I told you the ratio at the beginning only 1 is to 150. So, for every 150 female, there is one male which may be having the breast cancer. The most common age is perimenopausal age. Perimenopausal age is, what is the perimenopausal age? 45 to 55 years of age. So, in perimenopausal, menopause we consider at 50. So, 5 years before, 5 years after. Perimenopausal, peri matlab aspas. So, perimenopausal age is the most common age of breast cancer. Okay, now how does it look like? The breast cancer is solitary mass. It's always painless. You can see a solitary mass. It's painless. It is a palpable lump present in the breast which is usually detected by the self-examination by the lady okay but the female is usually self-diagnosing it because she can palpate it okay it's solitary now uh, the uh, biggest tragedy is that it's painless i think it should be painful because it is because it is painless now patient don't take care of it in the countries like india the developing countries where female don't take too much of care for their health and if there is a painless mass, they don't bother about it. They don't think. Now, it is a common psychology or mentality of the human. Something which is giving the pain to the human, that is more troublesome. Something which is painless, that is, you know, that is not troublesome. That is not troublesome. That is not horrible. But here, reverse is there. It's painless, but it's malignant. But it's malignant. Since it is painless, therefore, sometimes diagnosis is very late and sometimes diagnosis is already in stage 4. Anna, the patient is already in stage 4. At that time, the diagnosis is there because it is painless. Patient don't take care of it because it is not giving any trouble to the patient, right? So, it's painless, it's solitary, it's palpable lump. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Now, coming on the triple technique. Can we start triple technique? So, what is triple technique? There are three techniques to diagnose the breast cancer at the first instant. Number one, palpation. As I told you, the self-palpation. So, ideally, all the females who are more than 50 years, they should do the breast self-examination at least once a month with a proper technique. All the four quadrants should be palpated. And if even if any female is feeling a smallest mass, as small as 0 0.1, 0 0.2 centimeter, 0 0.5 centimeter, that should be notified to the doctor, to the surgeon, to the physician, and that should be tested. It can be malignant. We can detect it at early stage. If we detect it at early stage in stage 1 only, now the cure rate is very high. Anna, and chances of recurrence are very, very less, nearly nil. Okay, so early diagnosis is the key. Early diagnosis and the best way to early diagnosis is the breast self-palpation. 
and it should be done once a month after 50 years of age with proper technique palpating all the four quadrants with the central quadrant also central uh, um, area also uh, once a month in all the ladies who are more than 50 years after that the second is the mammography you know what is mammography the mammography is the best technique to detect the breast cancer so again after 50 years of age prophylactic mammography should be done, done twice um, once in a two, two years every every biannual once in two years it should be done prophylactically and if lady is feeling the palpable mass anywhere in the self palpation it should be confirmed on the mammography right so the second thing is the mammography in the triple technique and the third thing is the FNEC what is the full form of FNEC can you tell me uh, what is the full form of FNEC it's fine needle aspiration cytology FNAC okay FNAC that is fine needle aspiration cytology so what basically we are doing here we are not doing the biopsy there is a difference between biopsy and FNAC in biopsy we take out the tissue we take out a small tissue, Hana. we give the local anesthesia and we take out a small tissue of that particular portion or tumor or whatever we are suspecting. But if in FNC, we don't take the tissue out, we take the cells out. How to take the cells out? So first, if, if the mass is palpable in the breast, you can see, you can see. The person who is examining and doing the FNC fix the mass with one of the hand, okay, fixing it. Then with another hand, a small needle is inserted inside that, and a small needle, a very thin, fine needle we insert it. And we do the to and fro motion like this, to and fro motion like this, like this. So that the tumor cells present inside this mass, they will get dislodged like this. Let me draw. So there is dislodge. The tumor cells will get dislodged inside this. Can you see the tumor cells I am drawing? They will dislodge and then suck the plunger, take the plunger out, take the plunger of the syringe out so that whatever tumor cells are dislodged and there is little bit bleeding also. So that will get collected in the syringe. Now take it out and spread it on a slide. Spread it on a slide and stain it. This is known as fine needle aspiration cytology. With the help of fine needle, you have aspirated a fluid. You have not cut the fluid. There is a difference between aspiration and cutting. In biopsy, we cut with a knife. We use a knife in biopsy. But here we are not using a knife. We are not cutting. We are using a needle and a syringe. We are aspirating. Here we are aspirating. No anesthesia is required. We don't give an, 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 an anesthesia. It's very cheap. Biopsy is costly. This one is very cheap. And reporting is also very fast. So FNAC we can do. And we spread it on the slide. We examine the slide under microscope after staining. Okay. And if the tumor cells are present here, we can see the tumor cells here. The biggest thing we cannot see the architecture, but we can see the cell morphology. We know what are dysplastic cells, what are anaplastic cells, how to differentiate the dysplastic anaplastic cells from the normal cells in the breast. Okay, we know that. Can we go ahead? Yeah, are you people there? Okay, the site of the FNAC varun is the tumor itself. Fix the tumor and try to take the FNAC from the center and the borders. Hana, you just insert the needle inside the tumor and do to and fro motion. Hana, sometimes it's very hard. Sometimes there is calcifications present. So, you know, it's difficult to insert the needle. But with resistance also, you can insert and you can do the to and fro motion slowly so that the cells get dislodged and you just aspirate it. So, along with the cells dislodged, there is little bit of bleeding. So, blood along with the tumor cells will be collected. A small fluid is collected, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 centimeter, depending how much is the yield. So, here we can collect the fluid, take out the syringe, we spread it on a slide and see it. Got it? Varun, can we go ahead? No, it's not under LA. It's not. For biopsy, it's under LA. This one is little bit painful. I know, but not very much painful. The female can bear such pain. We don't give any local anesthesia. It's simple OPD basis. We do it routinely in the OPD itself. Okay. So, it's not under LA. No LA is given. So, that's why it's very cheap. Reporting is also very fast. Here, we don't have to make the block, the paraffin block. You know, like for biopsy, we have to process it overnight. Then we have to make a block. Anna? Then we have to cut it, trim it, stain it. Here, directly spreading, making a smear and staining. Anna? So, the reporting can be done as fast as within 2-3 hours. The only time required is the staining. After staining, it's ready to see under microscope. And if the pathologist is available, it can be uh, reported as soon as possible. Okay, got my point. So, FNEC is fast and uh, it's cheap and no LA is required, Hana, less invasive, Hana, less costly. These are the advantages. The only disadvantages on the slide, you will see only cells. You will not see the complete architecture of the tissue. You can't see the arrangement of the cell. But what you can see is the morphology of the cell, morphology of the nucleus and the cell. Got it? The cell, cell morphology can be seen here. So that is the thing. Now I'm coming on the next point. The next point is the risk factors. 
the risk factors of the breast cancer how many risk factors you know there are 11 risk factors you know that is known as etiology now whenever you do the diagnosis of breast cancer breast cancer in any female the first question the lady will ask you doctor why me why not others why only me it happened to me why it doesn't happen to others am i exposed to some risk factors am i exposed to certain risk factors i am i'm having some some so that can be avoided in others yes so there are 11 risk factors some of them are modifiable avoidable i mean some of them are non avoidable so let me enumerate the 11 risk factors for you can i start the risk factors one by one huh so the first one what you are asking dr marriott uh, the features you are asking that is covered in session one of oncology please watch the recording it's available on the same youtube channel you can see there i have enumerated the 10 features of anaplasia that is malignancy that all will be seen here in the cells okay okay that will be in short i'm telling you that is pleomorphism loss of basal polarity mitosis necrosis and anisonucleosis these all features you will see that is the features of anaplasia got it so let's come on the risk factors of the breast cancer now one by one so the first risk factor is the geographical and racial factor it is more common in developed country as compared to developing country the breast cancer is more common four to six times more common in the developed country as compared to developing countries like asia and africa it is not very much common as much it is common in the developed countries like us the reason is the late marriages and nulliparity so in in western culture in developed countries, I mean, the late marriage is very common and the nulliparity is also very common. I know. So, these are the reasons because I will tell you the reason why late marriage and nulliparity may be a risk factor for the breast cancer. Coming on the second one, the family history. If someone is having a first degree relative having the breast cancer, by first degree relative, by first degree relative, I mean three, three persons, the mother, the sister, the daughter. If any female whose mother or whose sister or whose daughter is having breast cancer, that lady is automatically at two to six times higher risk of developing breast cancer in future as compared to other females who don't have uh, breast cancer history in the family. So, because breast cancer is one of the cancer that runs in the family, like the ovarian cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, these are the familial cancer, they run in families because it is the mutated gene that is running in the family. So, anyone's mother, any female's mother, sister or daughter having the breast cancer, that female is at increased risk of developing breast cancer in future as compared to another female who don't have any family history of the breast cancer okay can we go ahead okay yes men can also have breast cancer Ahmed, i told you but the risk is very less it's one is to 150 every 150 female one male can have breast cancer okay um okay what you are asking kiran what happened if la is given only we can give kiran of course we can give nothing will happen but if that it will be invasive and costly now you have to admit the patient you have to give the la you have to do it unnecessary we don't uh, want to give la why to increase the costing of the test it is a little bit test as little as uh, like the pain during the blood collection for doing blood collection from the cubital vein we don't give la we take it directly it is a little pain it is a thin needle which we are inserting and doing to and fro motion very thin very thin needle we are inserting so hardly any pain is there a little bit that can be bared but still if the if the female is very uh, pain sensitive and she requests us to give the la we can do so fnac can also be done in la there is no problem in that okay but biopsy we cannot do uh, without la because we are cutting a tissue it's very painful okay so first we have to give the la got the answer can we go ahead okay i'm coming on the risk factors on the diet also i will come sheen wait a while so this is the second risk factor i told you can i come on the third risk factor the third risk factor is very important that is menstruation and obstetric history what do you mean by menstrual and obstetric history what do you mean by menstrual and obstetric history let me tell you listen you have to understand a diagram here okay listen here this is the birth of a female this is the birth of a female and this is the death of a female right at 13 to 15 years there is mean arch what is mean arch in a female the mean arch is the event when she start menstruating by menstruating start i mean the ovary become functional here and ovary starts secreting estrogen as well as ova so she is fertile from mean arch and at the age of 45 to 50 years there is menopause what is menopause by menopause i mean an event in the life of a female when the menstruation is stopped the ovaries get shrink there is no estrogen in the blood ovary is not secreting the estrogen in the blood i mean and um, she is non-fertile so the fertile period of the female is 15 to 45 or 15 to 50 we can say 45 or 50 so these are the 30 or 35 years of fertility in the life of a female we all can understand i know so my point is that here estrogen comes in the blood estrogen start coming and here estrogen stop 
because ovary become non functional it become shrink here ovary start functioning so for 30 to 35 years the female blood contain estrogen and she all the tissues organs are exposed to estrogen now listen the biggest theory the biggest principle is that breast cancer is directly proportional to estrogen estrogen exposure to the tissue more is the estrogen present in the blood more it is exposed to the breast tissue the breast becomes sensitive to develop the breast cancer during menopausal age perimenopausal age so more is the estrogen in the blood more is the chances the female will have breast cancer you got this theory how many of you got this theory got it so more is the estrogen in the blood more is the chances the female will have breast so you may be thinking that ma'am estrogen exposure is constant now all the females have menarch all the females have menopause so 30 to 35 years of estrogen exposure that is common in all female does it vary from female to female yes it can vary from female to female imagine a female who is having few years of early menarch so these are the additional years added for estrogen exposure or else imagine a female who is having late menopause and right? some females may have late so early menarch is a risk factor early menarch and late menopause is also a risk factor some females having late menopause so these are the additional years of estrogen exposure so she may be at high risk of developing breast cancer as compared to other females who have menopause and menarch at normal time so early menarch and late menopause both are risk factors how many of you got it this is the menstrual history in the menstrual history you always have to ask the female when what is the age of your menarch what is the age of the menopause if age of menarch is you know it's early and if the age of the menopause is late the female is at high risk already at high risk of developing the breast cancer how many of you got it say yes say no say something this is the menstrual history now coming on the obstetric history now obstetric history why it is important please understand everyone now during the fertile period as I told you, this is the fertile period from menarch to meno menopause. This is the fertile period the female get pregnant during multiple times. Now, it is, it may, she may become pregnant one time, two time, three time, four time, multiple time. It's her wish. It's her life. Okay. Now, the point is that in human, the gestational age is nine months, nine days. Normally, it's, it's normally it's like that. Anna? So, during the gestational period, it's not estrogen which is predominant in the blood of the female. During pregnancy, it's the progesterone. So, that 9 months will be deduced from the total 30-35 years. So, how many times she become pregnant? That may, that that times the period 9 into 1, 9 into 2, 9 into 3, 9 into 4. The Depending how many times she become pregnant, that time is uh, deduced from the total uh, estrogen exposure in her lifetime. So, my point is that more is the parity, multi-parity. It reduces the risk of breast cancer. And that's why nulli parity increases the risk of breast cancer. It is at highest risk of developing breast cancer. Imagine a female who is not married or who is married but not getting pregnant due to fertile issues or any issues. She is not pregnant even a single time in her lifespan. So, she is at high risk of developing breast cancer in the perimenopausal age. Anna? Because all the time she is exposed to estrogen. This is also a point. Anna? So, nulli para females are at high risk of developing breast cancer and multi para females are at low risk of developing breast cancer. This is the obstetric history. Not only this, let me continue and finish. Let me continue. After the delivery of the baby, what happened? Uh, we recommend exclusive breastfeed for the next six months. And we recommend breastfeeding up to two years. Anna? Up to two years, the breastfeeding should be done. But up to six months, it should be exclusive. Anna? So after pregnancy, after the delivery, all the females should breastfeed their babies. We recommend that to all the females who deliver. Anna? So we recommend that. During breastfeeding also, it is the progesterone, which is predominant in the blood. So, you know, breastfeeding is a very important, um, uh, you can say, the event. Breastfeeding is useful for the baby. Of course, the baby is getting the nutritious uh, 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 milk from the mother. Not only for baby, the breastfeeding is uh, uh, beneficial for the mother also. Mother is reducing her risk of developing breast cancer in future by breastfeeding the baby. Baby is getting the milk, of course. Anna, it's, it's very immune. It's highly immunogenic. It contains antibody. It contains nutrition. It's good for the baby. But mother by breastfeeding is also reducing her risk of developing breast, breast cancer in the future. How many of you got it? How many of you got it? Yes, additional six months or whatever. So, this is the thing. Yes. Yes, Dr. Marriott, of course. More the pregnancy, less is the chances of breast cancer. That's what I'm saying. Multiparity reduces the risk and nulliparity increases the risk. That's what I am uh, saying. Okay, can we go ahead? Okay, yes, more is the duration of the estrogen exposure, more is the chances of the risk factor. That's why the menstrual and obstetric history is ultra important for contributing the risk factor in a breast cancer. Can you please enumerate the risk factor? 
Tell me first menstrual history. You say ma'am, early menarche and late menopause. Both are risk factor. If some female is having early menarche, that many years are additionally added for the estrogen exposure. If any lady is having late menopause, that many years are additionally added. Number two. No, no. Apart from that, multiparity reduces the risk. Nulliparity increases the risk. More is the pregnancies, reduces the chance of breast cancer. Okay. And... Um, and breastfeeding always reduces the chance of breast cancer. And now, during the breastfeeding, it is the progesterone exposure that will be reduced from the total estrogen exposure. How many of you got it? How many? So, this is how the menstrual and the obstetric history is important. So, early menarche, late menopause and nulliparity. These are the risk factors for breast cancer. I hope you all got it. I hope you all got it. So, these are the risk factors for the breast cancer. The next year, I already quoted estrogen exposure. Estrogen is synthesized in the ovary, but sometimes some female take exogenous, extra exogenous um, uh, estrogen. Tell me a condition when the lady is taking exogenous uh, estrogen in the form of the tablets or syrups. Huh? When she will take? Uh, have you heard about the menopause? Of course, I told you what is menopause. During menopause, the menstruation stop. Hana, the ovary gets shrink. In the female, both the ovaries will get shrink. So they reduce the estrogen in the blood. So suddenly, estrogen in the blood get reduced dramatically. Uh, after menopause suddenly and menstruation stop okay but estrogen have multiple role in the human body metabolic role is also there estrogen is performing in the human body in females so the mood mood of the lady is um, balanced by estrogen you can say and the bone the bones are also strengthened by the estrogen now if estrogen is stopped suddenly some females may have sudden mood fluctuation Anna, she, they, they may be very much depressed. Sudden mood fluctuations can be there. Uh, bone also become very fragile. Osteopetrosis, osteoporosis uh, risk will increase. In such females, not all menopausal females. In such female, we give exogenous hormones. Exogenous hormone, it is known as hormonal therapy. Anna, it is known as hormone replacement therapy, HRT. It is given at menopause and gradually we reduce the dose. It is not sudden. It is gradually we will reduce it and after all, after, uh, after some time we will just um, switch off. But gradually we do so. Not suddenly. We will do the tapering gradually. Anna? So this is hormone replacement therapy. It is known as hormonal therapy. But hormonal therapy contain estrogen. You are giving additional estrogen after the menopause. The female is already menopause. But you are giving exogenous the estrogen just to combat some symptoms. So again, it can increase the risk of the breast cancer. Okay, what about oophorectomy? Imagine a female. Imagine a female. You can see she is a female and um, she is having the ovaries. Now, due to some problem in the ovaries, maybe cancer in the ovaries, maybe trauma in the ovaries, maybe some other problem in the ovaries, the oophorectomy is done. Bilateral oophorectomy is already done. Anna. So she don't have ovaries. Anna. She don't have ovaries in the young age only. Okay, the oophorectomy surgery is done. So, she is at reduced risk of developing breast cancer because before the menopause, before many years ahead of that, the ovaries are removed. So, if the oophorectomy is done due to any other reason, it reduces the risk of developing breast cancer. Okay. So, that can be the reason. Now, coming on the next risk factor that is fibrocystic disease. What is fibrocystic disease? Fibrocystic disease are the benign diseases. There are many types of fibrocystic disease. The most important among them is atypical epithelial hyperplasia. That increases the risk of breast cancer five times. It's a benign disease. So, any female having fibrocystic disease should always be cautious. In future, she can have malignant cancer. Anna, the atypical hyperplasia. Coming on the dietary factors. Someone was asking about the dietary factors. Now, the female who consume high amount of fat, high calorie food are at high risk. The female who smoke are at high risk. The female who consume alcohol are at high risk. So, smoking, alcohol consumption, fat and calories increases the risk of the breast cancer these are the dietary and you can say not only dietary smoking and alcohol you can say lifestyle changes so lifestyle dietary and lifestyle also affect breast cancer exercise exercise always have a protective role the females who are physically active who are not obese who are normal weight they are, they are not overweight they are not obese they are normal weight they are at reduced risk of developing breast cancer in the future Hannah. so exercise always have protective role in breast cancer okay Coming on the next is the breast density. Anna, female to female, the breast density differs. So, the females who is having high density of the breast, having high risk of developing breast cancer in the future. Okay. The next is the environmental toxin. In the environment, we have multiple pesticides. You know, we are eating, we are drinking, we are inhaling multiple chemicals surrounding us. Some of them may be mutagenic. That can cause mutations and that can lead to cancers. Anna, so, environmental toxins is always a risk factor. The next is the radiation exposure. 
What do you mean by radiation exposure? Imagine a small little girl is there. Maybe adolescent girl is there. Anna? And um, she is having a mediastinal lymphoma. The lymph nodes here get enlarged. Anna? Maybe Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. She is having lymphoma in which the mediastinal lymph nodes are enlarged. What treatment you will offer to this female? Of course, we will offer the radiotherapy anna, to the lymph nodes. You are giving radiotherapy to treat the lymphoma, the lymph nodes in the mediastinum. But in the in the mediastinum, the breast is also present. And in the thorax, the breast is. So, you are exposing the breast to the radiotherapy. Now, in future, this lady is at high risk of developing breast cancer because the breast is already exposed to radiation due to certain reason. And now, or else, not radiotherapy, not lymphoma. Imagine another example. She is a girl in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Have you heard about uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, bomb explosion? So, during the bomb explosion, uh, the complete body is exposed to the radiation. The thorax, the breast is also exposed to radiation. So, in future, she is having high risk of developing breast cancer. Okay, got it. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Okay. Okay. So, yes. So, many of them are modifiable. Many of them are non-modifiable, Dr. Matriot. Got it. Can we go ahead? Anyone having any, any doubt? The last risk factor is the genetic factors. Now, genetic factors. These all I told you, these are the sporadic causes of the breast cancer. Now, the genetic factors. There are three genes you have to learn. What are the name of the three genes? Let me tell you the three genes. Barca 1, Barca 2 and P53. What do you mean by Barca 1 and Barca 2? What is the full form of Barca? BR is breast. C is carcinoma. Breast carcinoma 1 gene. Breast carcinoma 2 gene and P53 gene. These are the three genes I am talking about. Okay, these are the three genes. Barca 1 gene present on chromosome number 17. Barca 2 gene present on chromosome number 13. And P53 also present on 17 like Barca 1. Okay, these all are tumor suppressor genes. If they get mutated, the person can have breast cancer and it is transmitted family to family, generation to generation. The mother can transmit it to the daughter like that. Anna? So, Barca 1 and Barca 2, if they are mutated, they carry the high risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer both. Breast cancer to hey yeah, but it is for ovarian cancer also. The risk increases. So Barca 1 and Barca 2 and P53. Learn the name of the three genes, please, very thoroughly. Okay. What about the male? If Barca 1, Barca 2 is mutated in male, what the male will have? Male will have prostate cancer. A mutated Barca 1, Barca 2 gene in the male leads to the prostate cancer. Can I come on the classification of the breast cancer? We are done with the 11 risk factors. You can enumerate all 11 risk factors. Okay. These are the risk factors for the breast cancer. I enumerated all of them. Can we go ahead? Okay, how many of you got it? Say something. Yes, no, say something. Can we go ahead? Can I start the classification of the breast cancer? And I, after that, I will give you the microscopy of each variant. How many of you with me? Respond. Give me a thumbs up. Can we go ahead? Okay. Okay. Contraceptive don't increase the risk of uh, breast cancer. Meena, you are asking about OCPs, I, I think. Hannah, OCPs also contain estrogen and progesterone. But estrogen is very little amount that do not expose the breast to additional estrogen and that will not increase the risk of breast cancer. So, OCPs do not increase the risk of breast, uh, breast cancer. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the compliment, Rajpal. Can we go ahead? Does anyone have any confusion? Can we go ahead? So, let me classify the breast cancer. We classify the breast cancer into two categories. Please see. Invasive, invasive carcinoma and non-invasive carcinoma. The non-invasive one also known as carcinoma in C2. Please understand very carefully. Now, if you can understand the classification, it will be easy for you to understand the morphological diagrams of all four. Okay, invasive, non-invasive. Each one of them is of 2-2 two -two type. Ductal lobular, ductal lobular. Ductal lobular, ductal lobular. So, total I am going to teach you the four types of the breast cancer. Two of them are non-invasive, two of them are invasive. What do you mean by invasive and non-invasive? Please understand. Can you see, I have already told you the diagram of the breast at the beginning of the session. You can see this is a female breast. You can see in the female breast, this is the nipple. You can see. And uh, inside the female breast, we can see small, small ductules are there. They all open in the terminal duct. These all are the terminal ducts. Multiple terminal ducts open in the lacticiferous duct. And lacticiferous duct finally open in the nipple. This is the diagram of the breast. Huh, no? Now, let me take any of the ductule. Can you see? Let me cut this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Any of the ductule I can see like this. You can see this is a ductule. Huh, no? This is a ductule. Okay. I told you what is ductal. Ductal means ductule. One ductule have the cancer. Huh, no? What is a lobule? You have to understand ductal and lobule. The difference between the ductule and the lobule. Ductule is one ductule. You can see this is one of the ductule. Huh, no? Illuminated structure lined by the double epithelium. You can see the inner one is the epithelial lining and the outer one, the flattened one is the myoepithelial lining. I can see double layered. It is a ductule. 
what is lobule 3 to 5 i told you 3 to 5 terminal ducts form one lobule let me draw let me draw 1 2 and 3 these are the three terminal ducts i am drawing now all the structures arising out of it for example let me draw many structures all the appendages arising from that you can see this one this one this one this one this one this one like that the multiple structures arising out of that this constitute one lobule my point is that one lobule contain multiple ductule one ductule is one ductule if you say ma'am where is one ductule i will say this one this is one of the ductule okay if you say where is one lobule i will say this complete one lobule so please understand the difference between the ductule and the lobule. If you can see the difference between ductule and lobule, it's easy for you to understand. Okay. You got it. How many of you got it? What is a ductule? What is a lobule? Ductule is one, but lobule is a collection of ductule. Three to five terminal ducts constitute one lobule. How many of you got it? Now, let me tell you the difference between invasive and non-invasive. What do you mean by invasive carcinoma? What do you mean by non-invasive carcinoma or carcinoma in situ? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Can you see here? See the upper three diagrams. Okay. Let me show you just a second. You can see this is a ductule containing one duct. When the tumor cells, tumor occurs, hai na, the anaplastic cells are present inside the ductule. They are not perforating and coming out. I will say it is in situ. Hai na? I will say it is ductal carcinoma, but it's in situ, non-invasive. The tumor is present, <clears throat> but it is present inside the ductule. It is not penetrating out. Got it? In the third diagram, you can see it is penetrating out. It is rupturing the ductule and the tumor cells are coming in the background stroma. It is known as invasive ductal carcinoma. This is also ductal carcinoma. This is also ductal carcinoma. This is non-invasive. This is invasive. By non-invasive, I mean duct ductal carcinoma in situ. So, I will say this is non-invasive one, ductal carcinoma, one duct is involved. And this is invasive ductal carcinoma, one duct is involved. But please understand the difference between the non-invasive and invasive. Non-invasive tumor cells are confined within the ductule. And in invasive, they just rupture and come out. They just rupture and come out. Got it? Got it? Now, coming on the lobule, please see. I told you what is a lobule? Multiple ductule form one lobule. What is multiple ductule? I mean three to five terminal ducts. Anna, focus, you are asking me to repeat. I say what is one lobule? One lobule is equal to three to five terminal ducts and all the ductules arising of that. So, let me draw three, three. One, two, three. These are the three terminal ducts. Now, how many ductules arise out of that? Let's say there are multiple, multiple, multiple ductules will arise out of that. And uh, these all will form one lobule. They all will form. This is complete one lobule. You got it, focus. So if you ask me, ma'am, in this diagram, where is ductule? I will say this one. One ductule, this one, one ductule, one ductule, one. So one, one, one is ductule. But if you take three to five terminal ducts, it will form one lobule. One lobule contain multiple ducts. How many of you got it? Now, I told you the ductal carcinoma. See the lower diagram. Now, see the lower diagram. In the lower diagram, two of them are shown to you. This is one, this is two. I mean to say it's multiple ductule. Here I told you one ductule. Here I am showing you multiple ductule. You can see multiple. And a multiple means two, three, four. It can be any number. This is one lobule. This is normal. It don't have cancer cell. It's normal. But here the cancer cells are present. Where are the cancer cells? I can see they are present inside the lobule. They are not perforating it and coming out. So, I will say this is non-invasive lobular carcinoma. That is lobular carcinoma in C2. In C2 means non-invasive. This one is non-invasive. It is present inside. And see the next one. It is perforating and the tumor cells are coming out. See the beauty of the diagram. This one is invasive lobular carcinoma. You can make it out. So, please make the difference. What is a ductule? What is a lobule? See the upper diagram. See the lower diagram. In the upper diagram, you all can see ductule is one. Lobule is multiple ductule. Anna, after that, see non-invasive in both of them and see invasive in both of them. Say something. Respond. Please. You got it? What I told you, the four types, all four types are visible in this diagram. Anna? So, let me draw. Let me draw one ductule. Okay. Okay. Let me draw one ductule and let me draw one lobule. In lo one lobule, we have multiple ductules. Okay. Now, let me draw the two things here. Okay. Let me draw the two things here. Okay. Here, I would like to teach you non-invasive and invasive. The non-invasive, non-invasive ductule, ductal carcinoma. Okay. And invasive ductal carcinoma. Here also non-invasive lobular carcinoma. This is a lobule and invasive lobular carcinoma I want to teach you. Okay, I want to teach you. Non-invasive one is known as in C2. Non-invasive and in C2 is one and the same thing. In C2 means it is inside. It's not coming out. That is the meaning of the in C2. In C2. Okay, you got it. So let me draw it here. Let me draw it here. Let me try to draw the tumor cell. Here tumor cells are concise inside only. Okay, here they will rupture and after rupturing they come out. They come out where? They come out and they spread in the background stone. 
here also the same thing will happen but here it's not one duct here multiple ducts are there here multiple ducts are there right here they are present concised inside them and here they will rupture and come out the problem is that only you got it so this one is known as ductal carcinoma in c2 this is known as lobular carcinoma in c2 okay this one is known as um, this one is known as ductal invasive carcinoma invasive ductal carcinoma this is invasive lobular carcinoma so please understand the meaning of all four so this is what written in front of you the breast cancer the breast cancer is of two type hana right? invasive non invasive non invasive is known as carcinoma in c2 this is ductal carcinoma in c2 lobular carcinoma in c2 hai right? na here ductal invasive carcinoma lobular invasive carcinoma how many of you got it so i will use the terminologies dcis lcis idc ilc i will use the four terminologies dcis lcis idc ilc okay so i will show four diagrams now one by one to you of the breast cancer got it can we go ahead give me a minute to fix the sound give me a minute so the four tumors i am going to show you one by one dcis lcis idc ilc ha na so let me start with non invasive carcinoma in c2 work first let me show you dcis lcis diagram can you see the diagram can you see the diagram these all are ductules let me draw the ductules for you imagine just a second this is a ductule this is a ductule this is a ductule and this is a ductule these all are ductules see the four first four diagrams these all are one 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 duct these all are ductules now they all have tumor cells inside them i cannot see the tumor cells are perforating penetrating and coming out so these all are dcis in all of them the tumor cells are concised inside the duct okay where are the tumor cells now the arrangement is different okay here in the first one you can see back to back solid compact arrangement this is known as solid type in the second type the tumor cells are present at the periphery and at the center there is a necrosis it is known as comedo type comedo type in the third one you can see in the third one you can see the tumor cells are here also but they are arranged in papillary finger like projections the tumor cells ka arrangement kya hai what is the arrangement the arrangement is finger like projection got it and in the fourth type tumor cells are also here but you can see there are small small holes in between it's not solid compact hai na like this it's small small holes are there it is looking like a sieve hai na hindi mein kahun to channi ke jaisa hai it's looking like a sieve it is known as cribriform type hai na so this is papillary this is cribriform so these are the four types okay okay these are the four types of dcis got it can you please tell me the four type of dcis what is one thing common in all of them the one thing which is common in all of them in all the dcis that the four ductules are there the tumor cells are concised inside them only they are not coming out the tumor cells are present only inside them of course that's why it's in situ that's why they all are ductule they are not lobule and the tumor cells are present inside them the point is that the arrangement differs so let me draw the four arrangements for you let me draw the four ductules for you 1 2 3 4 where i am drawing the tumor cells if i draw the tumor cells throughout like this back to back compact solid manner this one is known as solid type if i draw it only at the periphery <clears throat> and at the center i show you a necrosis this one is known as comedo type okay or else i can show you the papillary like arrangements you can see these are the papillae okay you can see the papillary you can see these are the papillary these are the papillary these are the papillary like ha na papillary like projections okay the third one and the fourth one uh, the sieves are present ha na tumors are present everywhere but but with holes this is papillary and this is known as cribriform how many of you got it so these are the four types of dcis in front of you please learn all of them one thing is common tumor cells are not penetrating and coming out they are present within the ductules that is the four types of the dcis the full form is ductal carcinoma in c2 okay now coming on lobular carcinoma in c2 the lobular carcinoma in c2 is only one type it's not a four type it's only one type you can see the diagram this one this is a lobule actually one duct is shown to you but you can imagine multiple ductules that is one lobule here only solid pattern is present the first one like this here only solid pattern is present here we don't have comedo cribriform and papillary pattern here only solid pattern is present so you may be thinking ma'am what is the difference of solid this is this one is lcis ha na what is the difference between solid of dcis and solid of lcis you may be thinking here also we are having the tumor cells but they are loosely arranged you can see the tumor cell arrangement here it's compact back to back and here it's loose here this one is loose here it's loosely arranged how many of you got it so i told you two diagrams till now ha na dcis and lcis in the dcis we have four options in lcis we have only one option 
Indicia is the pore are solid, papillary, comedo, cribriform. Here only solid is there. So we are done with the in C2. Now I will come on the invasive one. Okay. You can see these are the four variants. You can read the description if you wish. Okay. These are the four variants of the DCIS. Solid, comedo, papillary, cribriform. In all of them, the arrangement differs. But the one thing which is common, tumor cells are not coming out. In LCIS, we have only one type. Hana? It is completely filling the terminal ducts and all the appendages. 3 to 5 terminal ducts. Hana? The cells are uniform and loosely arranged. That is cohesive type. You can see this one. Hana? There is one more unique thing which is, which is there in LCIS. LCIS usually occurs in bilateral breast. Hana? DCIS occurs unilaterally only. Either left side or right side. But here, whenever you find LCIS, I'll always check the opposite breast of the female. If you are finding LCIS in the right breast, look for the left breast also. If you are finding LCIS in the left breast, look for the right breast. So, always look for the opposite breast also for LCIS. How many of you got it? It's usually bilateral. So, contralateral breast, you have to check. It's the rule. Whenever it is LCIS. It's a question also. And a MCQ also. So, we are done with the non-invasive one. The in C2 one. Hana, we are done with DCIS. DCIS. We are done with LCIS. DCIS have four patterns in front of you. LCIS have only one pattern. That's in front of you. So, coming on the invasive one. Non-invasive in C2 are done. Now, coming on the invasive one. Invasive carcinoma. Okay, invasive carcinoma. Here also we have ductal and lobular. Invasive ductal carcinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma. One by one we will see. You see invasive ductal. This one is invasive ductal. What you can see here? It's very easy. If you know the basic, you can interpret. You can see a ductule. You can see a ductule. In this ductule, I can see the solid pattern. The tumor cells are arranged back to back. In this one, I can see a necrosis at the center and tumor cells at the periphery. So, this one is comedo. So, I can see two type of DCIS out of four here. I can see there is solid type. I can see there is comedo type. The point is that I can see the stroma also. And I can see the tumor cells in the stroma also. Where are the tumor cells in the stroma? Please. You can see tumor cells. Can you see the background stroma? In that the tumor cells are present in the clusters, in the groups, in the form of the gland or singly. Singly, singly tumor cells are present. So, multiple type of tumor cells are present in the background. Apart from the ducts, the tumor cells perforated the drug, penetrated the drug and they came in the stroma. See, they are present in the form of the glands, clusters. So, stroma, stroma contain, stroma contain the tumor cell. So, it is no more in C2 now and I will call it as an invasive. How many of you got it? Got it? Please say. If you got it, please say something. Got it? Just a second. Okay, I'm sorry. So, yes. So, you can see. Okay. So, this is the thing. Okay. So, you can see the tumor cells in the background. Okay. So, solid tumor cells are present in the stroma in the form of the nest, cord, glands. They are present. The anaplastic tumor cells are present in the background in the stroma. In the stroma, the tumor cells are present. I know, that is the thing. I know. So, this is the biggest thing you can see here. Coming on invasive lobular carcinoma, here also you can see. What you can see here, tell me. In this diagram, what you can see? I can see this is a lobule. This is a lobule. And a lobule contains multiple ducts. And here we have only one pattern, the solid one. So, here also I can see the solid pattern here also because we don't have only one option here. We don't have multiple options. But see the stroma. I am more interested in the stroma now. You see the stroma, please. What you can see in the stroma? In the stroma also tumor cells are present. But what is the arrangement? Can you see the tumor cells in the stroma? Say yes or no. The tumor cells are arranged in the stroma forming a line one behind the other. They form a line one behind the other. It's not gland. It's not nest. It's not cluster. It's not group. It's not singly. It's always one behind the other. So one behind the other is known as Indian file pattern. What it is known as one behind the other. Can you see this arrangement? This arrangement is known as one behind the other. This arrangement is known as Indian file pattern. So, can I say the tumor cells are present in the stroma in the background in the form of the Indian file pattern? That is one behind the other. How many of you got it? The meaning of the Indian file pattern. Indian file means one behind the other. One behind the other. So, tumor cells are present. So, see, compare both. Compare both. I told you two type of invasive carcinoma. This one is also invasive. This one is also invasive. But this one is ductal. This one is lobular. In each of them, you find the duct ductule or lobule. Anna? Ductal may we find the ductule. This is a ductule. This is a ductule. In the lobular, I find a lobule. This is a lobular. This is a lobular. But I am interested in the stromal tumor cells. So, here also stroma contain tumor cell. Here also stroma contain tumor cell. But here, we don't have any peculiar uh, uh, arrangement. Here, it can be singly. 
it can be in a row it can be in a gland it can be in a group it can be a cluster it can be glandular but in lcis it's always one behind the other forming a line it's always 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 like that so here it is known as indian file pattern how many of you got it appreciate both of them have one thing common the background contain the stroma that's why both of them are invasive they are no more carcinoma in situ i tried my best to explain you how many of you got it yes yes ayush absolutely right yes dr marriott absolutely right what about others all those who are watching live give me a thumbs up got it so we are done with the four types of the breast cancer the names are written in front of you we are done with non invasive in situ carcinoma also and we are done with the invasive one also you can see the in situ carcinoma the ductal one dcis is of four type solid comedo papillary and fibriform and here only one pattern solid and here and here in both of them the stromal invasion is there the stroma contain the tumor cell the stroma here also contain the tumor cell but here stroma contain tumor cell in various pattern it can be group cluster it can be anything but here it's always one behind the other in a line that is known as indian file pattern i hope everyone got it okay so these are the four types of the breast cancer but before that i would like to tell you before i will uh, show you some mcqs i would like to tell you one more thing here very important in the breast cancer is the paget disease of the nipple have you heard about the paget disease of the nipple it's it's also cancer in the breast okay here there is a lady there is a female which will present to the opd with axiomatoid lesion around the nipple what i am using the word axiomatoid axiomatoid lesion can you see axiomatoid lesion around the breast so the female will have itching around the nipple axiomatoid lesion and redness redness itching around the uh, nipple she can't feel any mass inside the breast she is just having around the nipple the skin get axiomatoid so she will present to some dermatologist she may think it, it is a dermatological condition it is some skin disease some skin disorder of course anyone will think like so only but it may represent a hidden malignancy yes it may represent a hidden malignancy so what is happening now actually i told you what is the diagram of the breast in the diagram of the breast i told you it's like that uh, in the female breast there are multiple small small ductules are there and uh, let me draw few of them they all open in the terminal ducts these all are the terminal ducts okay multiple terminal ducts combined together and it open in the lactiferous duct this is the lactiferous duct you can see this is opening here this is opening like that multiple lactiferous duct uh, multiple terminal ducts they open in lactiferous duct now imagine there is a malignancy here a small very small the female cannot palpate it it's very 0.2 0.3 cm very small so basically what is happening now the tumor cells are coming over the terminal ductules like that they are traveling 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 they come in the lactiferous duct they travel 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 they reach the nipple and in the nipple we have the skin ha na so there is a skin present over the nipple in the female breast okay in the skin there are two layers epidermis and dermis so these tumor cells penetrate the epidermis of the skin around the nipple where they are penetrating these are the tumor cells which are penetrating in the epidermis of the skin around the nipple ha na so that's why that's why the female have a axiomatoid lesion around the nipple female feel redness itchiness because tumor cells already infiltrated the epidermis how does this tumor cells are known as these tumor cells are known as paget cell paget cell ha na paget cells are the tumor cells they are big abundant cytoplasm they have so if you take the biopsy of the nipple so in the epidermis of the nipple you get the tumor cell that is paget cell with abundant cytoplasm that is how you can diagnose and underlying there is a small malignancy that is hidden so this is known as paget disease how many of you got it okay how many of you got it paget paget disease okay so this is the paget disease so what is paget disease it is axiomatoid lesion of the nipple associated with invasive carcinoma of underlying breast so underlying hidden carcinoma is there the nipple become crusted scaly axiomatoid ha na and you can palpate a subarular small mass sometime it is a malignant tumor and also if you are a dermatologist and any lady presented like that always rule out the underlying malignancy it can represent the paget with underlying malignancy right so diagnosis i told you the pathogenesis you can see this is the tumor cell here the tumor cells are traveling around the lactiferous duct and you see how they are entering they are reaching the nipple on reaching the nipple they enter the epidermis you can see this is epidermis you can make out in the epidermis they they penetrate randomly so the epidermis contain epidermis of the nipple not dermis epidermis of the nipple contain big big tumor cells these are the paget cell containing abundant cytoplasm this is paget disease 
so the tumor cells from the underlying carcinoma migrate to the lactiferous duct penetrate the nipple in the epidermis of the nipple producing a skin lesion in the nipple so the patient feels she may have a nipple a skin disorder but this is not skin or dermatological disease hai na it is representing ah yeah it is a skin disorder here the epidermis contain the tumor cells the tumor cells present in epidermis of the nipple okay but it represent a underlying cancer so always look for the underlying cancer in case the patient is presenting with a nipple nipple crusted fissured and uh, ulcerated with oozing of blood i guess everyone got it varun ayush dr mary or others ana this is a gross histologically you have to take a biopsy in the biopsy the hallmark is that you get paged cell in the epidermis you can see this is all epidermis ana in the epidermis these are the tumor cells you can see big big tumor cells with clear cytoplasm paged cell are having big cell with cytoplasmic halo clear cytoplasm you can see right now coming on the most important ultra important thing the molecular classification of the breast cancer after that we will see the staging and um, uh, grading and we will end breast cancer and come on the next cancer okay so coming on the molecular classification of breast cancer you know female breast this is the female breast let me draw female breast now the female breast multiple cells are there okay let me draw normal cells in the female breast these are the normal epithelial cells arranged in the form of the ductules okay on the surface of the female breast normally estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor are present er pr er is estrogen receptor pr is progesterone receptor they are present normally and third more receptor it is known as her2 receptor so these are the three receptor present normally also in a healthy in a healthy normal female breast these are the receptors so they are present in low concentration they are present in low concentration what does it represent imagine i am drawing a breast cell and this is the receptor i am talking about ERPR are together. I will write them together. ERPR. What is the full form of ERPR? Estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. They are always together. That's why I will write like this. And HER2. HER2. So whenever the corresponding signal will come, I mean when ER or PR will come and bind here, this cell will divide. It will do the mitosis. And when HER2 will come and bind here, this cell will divide. Anna? So that is the growth factor binding with the growth receptor. So whenever growth factor will come, then only this cell will divide. Otherwise, it will not divide. so when this cell will divide when erpr will come i mean the estrogen and progesterone will come and bind with erpr or when her2 will come and bind with her2 receptor how many of you got it got it ha huh? got it ha huh, no so that is the molecular classification that is the basis of classification erpr and her2 receptor let me show you the normal breast and cancer breast can you see this is a cell in this diagram you can see two cells please appreciate the two cells shown you in this diagram this is a normal breast cell this is a cancer breast cell you can see the two type of the breast cell the normal breast cell and the cancer breast cell right this is a normal breast cell having erpr a little bit and cancer breast cell it increases abruptly ana the same occurs with her2 you can see this is a normal breast cell this is a cancer cell breast see her2 normally and see her2 in the cancer cancer cell in the cancer breast cell it increases abruptly got it based on that we classify the breast cancer the so breast cancers are of four type how many type of breast cancers are there please tell me how many type of breast cancers are there please tell me okay ha huh? there are four types of breast cancer luminal type a luminal type b base cell and her2 positive okay please understand if erpr is positive but her2 is negative it is known as luminal a okay luminal a if erpr as well as her2 both are positive it's luminal b If both are negative, these are basal. Basal are also known as triple negative breast cancer. You understand the meaning of the triple negative? They are ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative. That's why triple negative the worst prognosis. And the fourth one are HER2 positive. They are only HER2 positive, as the name indicates. They are ER PR negative. You may be thinking, ma'am, why being a doctor, why I should know the breast cancer of my patient is ER PR? What does it matter to me? It matters for two things. Number one, the ER PR status represent the prognosis, and number two, you will decide the treatment for your patient. What is the treatment of a breast cancer? By the way, generalized treatment. Ah, no, generalized treatment of a breast cancer. There is a patient having a breast cancer. It's malignant. It's cancer. It's invasive. Ah, no, it's not benign. So, can you tell me the treatment? Of course, the primary treatment is a surgery. You have to remove it. There is no tumor that will disappear of its own with any medicine. With any medicine, it cannot, you know, dissolve. You have to do the surgery. You have to operate and take it out unless and until it is not stage four. If it is stage four, already spread it throughout the body. There is no need to take it out now because it is already spread it throughout the body. okay but up to stage 1 2 3 we operate and take the tumor out okay this is surgery the primary treatment after that we give the chemotherapy ha na if any tumor cells have already spreaded in the blood imagine if the tumor cells already spreaded in the blood like that 
सो कीमोथेरेपी विल किल दो सेल्स एंड वी गिव द रेडियोथेरेपी रेडियोथेरेपी इज लोकल है ना सो हियर आफ्टर द सर्जरी टू द मार्जिन ऑफ द सर्जरी वी गिव द रेडियोथेरेपी इफ एनी ट्यूमर सेल स्टिल प्रेजेंट इन द मार्जिन लिटिल बिल्ट एक का दुबका कुछ भी प्रेजेंट है तो द रेडियोथेरेपी विल किल दैट सो वी आर गिविंग सर्जरी कीमोथेरेपी रेडियोथेरेपी अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट द फोर्थ ट्रीटमेंट इज हार्मोनल थेरेपी वॉट डू वी गिव हार्मोनल थेरेपी एंड टारगेट थेरेपी What do you mean by hormonal and tar target therapy? That depends on ERPR status. So for deciding hormonal and target therapy of the patient, you have to tell me ERPR uh, status. If the patient is ER positive or PR positive, I will give a drug that will inhibit ERPR synthesis. Hai na? Like I will give the drug that is known as tamoxifen. Tamoxifen. It is the name of the drug that we will give when the patient is ERPR. It is in the form of the tablet, tablet, and patient has to take for the next five years or seven years. Okay. And if the patient is HER2 positive, we have to give a targeted therapy that is uh, anti HER2. Anna? That will inhibit the synthesis HER2 blocker, synthesizer blocker. Anna? So the name of the drug is Herceptin. Herceptin. Anna? It's the an monoclonal antibody trastuzumab. Herceptin. So that depends what treatment you will give to your patient. So this patient gave, given only tamoxifen. This one tamoxifen plus Herceptin both. This one given nothing. No hormonal, no targeted therapy, only chemotherapy. And here we will give only Herceptin. Herceptin is very costly drug. And it is given in the form of the IV. And it's not oral. Tamoxifen is oral. It's not that way costly. How many of you got it? How many of you got it? Huh? So this is the thing. So imagine there is a breast cancer. Let me draw four types of cancer cells in front of you. I'm drawing all of them are cancer cells. Nothing is normal. These all are breast cancer cell in front of you. There are four types of breast cancer cell. I know some have ERPR receptor on them. Multiple ERPR receptor. I know multiple ERPR receptor you can see. Okay. Some have only HER2 receptor on them. Okay. Multiple HER2 receptor on them. These all are HER2. Some have both. Some ERPR and uh, say some HER2. Some HER2. Okay, so let me write down both. They are ERPR also positive and HER2 also positive and some have none. Okay, so what treatment you will offer? It means, please understand, here if ERPR is coming, it is dividing. Here HER2 is coming, it is dividing. Here both, ERPR also causing the division, HER2 also causes the division. Here something else is causing the division yet not discovered. We don't know the growth factor for that. It's under query. We don't know. We are discovering yet. We have not yet discovered. So, if we give a drug that that block this receptor. So if estrogen is coming, it cannot bind. Progesterone is coming, it cannot bind. Or block here. If HER2 is coming, that cannot bind. So these blocker can prevent the recurrence. You understood the concept? So here we give ERPR blocker, that is tamoxifen. Here we give HER2 blocker, that is Herceptin. Here we give both. And this one is a triple negative. That's that's the worst prognosis, basal one. So this is known as luminal type A, luminal A. This one is known as luminal B. Okay. And this one is known as triple negative breast cancer. That is basal one. The worst prognosis. And these one are known as HER2 positive. Only HER2 positive. That is the four types of breast cancer in front of you. How many of you got it actually? So if you are a uh, oncologist, you are treating your patient. So before deciding the complete treatment, it's must for you to know the ERPR status and HER2 status of your patient. So take out the biopsy or take out the tumor during surgery, send it to the laboratory. In the laboratory, the ISC will be performed on that and the pathologist will let you know the patient have which type of breast cancer cell. Is it this one, this one, this one, this one? Based on that, you decide your treatment. If it is ERPR positive, give the patient tamoxifen. And if it is HER2 positive, give the patient Herceptin or Trastuzumab. So depends on that, you decide your treatment. So treatment and prognosis depends on the molecular classification. What about the prognosis, which is the best one? Luminal A is the best one. I told you luminal A. This is the best prognosis. And the triple negative is having the worst prognosis. Anna, please learn. Prognosis wise also, treatment wise also. You require this classification. So how many of you got it? Tell me the molecular classification of the breast cancer. Depending, is it ERPR positive or is it HER2 positive? We divide the breast cancer into four categories. Anna? So what are the possibilities? First, say the possibility. Either this positive, this negative or this positive, this negative. Or both positive or both negative. Or kya ho sakta hai? There are only four possibilities. Name them. Name them. If ERPR positive but HER2 negative, it is known as luminal type A, the best one. Okay, the best one. If HER2 positive but ERPR negative, these are known as HER2 positive cancers. HER2 enriched, HER2 positive cancer. If both are positive, Anna, don't call them triple positive. Call them luminal B. They are triple positive but call them luminal B. Okay, moderate prognosis. But if everything is negative, you know, all of them are negative, call them basal type. 
What do you mean by basal triple negative breast cancer? Okay, this is how you can prevent the recurrence in your patient. This is the best and this is the worst. Anna? And treatment also you decide like that. Here only tamoxifame, here only herceptin, here tamoxifame as well as herceptin, here nothing. Here we cannot give. Anna? But the costly, it's good you are giving nothing. But you know, for the patient it's bad. The patient will present with more recurrence. Recurrence are more. It's aggressive and recurrence are very common in triple negative breast cancer. How many of you got it? This is the classification, the molecular classification. The same thing is written in front of you. You can see the breast cancer. What are luminal A? Luminal A is ERPR positive but HER2 negative. What are luminal B? Luminal B is HER2 positive but ERPR, uh, I'm sorry. The luminal B is all positive. ERPR also positive and HER2 also positive. Okay. And uh, HER2 enriched is HER2 positive but ERPR negative. And basal is everything negative. These are known as triple negative. Okay. So, please see the worst prognosis and the best prognosis. Like that you can decide. Can we go ahead now? Can we go ahead now? Say something. Yes, no. Okay. So, this is what we have seen the molecular classification. Okay. After that coming on the grading of the tumor. How you do the grading? Who does the grading? The grading is done by a pathologist. And staging is done by a clinician. The grading is done by pathologist because grade is seen on the microscopy. So make the slide, make the slide of your tumor. You have to look for three things. Anna, tubules are there or not there? Pleomorphism is there or not there? Mitosis is there or not there? Let me explain what you mean by that. Can you see the three type of tumors? All of them are breast cancer. You see, this is also a breast cancer. This is also a breast cancer. This is also a breast cancer. Anna, so here I see all the cells are uniform. Uniform means pleomorphism is not there. Pleomorphism is not there. Here, pleomorphism is moderate. Some are small, some are large, but it's moderate. Here, abundant pleomorphism is there. Some of them are very small. Some of them are very large. Some of them are normal size. So, here, abundant. So, pleomorphism is mild or moderate or severe. Based on that, we divide is it grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. That is, pleomorphism ka grading V2. Hai na? Pleomorphism, we say, this is pleomorphism. Just a second. For pleomorphism, grade score 1, score 2, score 3. The one thing you have to look for the pleomorphism. Not only this, you have to count the mitosis here. In all the cells, count the mitosis. And in one high power field, is it less than 5 mitosis, 5 to 10 mitosis or more than 10 mitosis? So again, give score 1, score 2, score 3. So one of the score for mitosis, one of the score for nuclear size, that is pleomorphism, and one of the score for tubule formation. Normal breast has abundant of tubule. If tubules are still retained, more than 75 tubules are present, it's score 1. If only 10 to 75% are present, it's score 2. And if less than 10% tubules are present, it's score 3. So, depending on the tubule formation, we also give the scoring. We also give the scoring TNM. This is known as TNM. T for tubule formation, N for nuclear size, M for mitosis. So, based on that, now, for all the patient, I have to give one of this score, one of this score, one of this score. Minimum, it can be 1, 1, 1, it's 3. Maximum, it can be 3, 3, 3, it's 9. You have to add the 3 score, I mean. Anna? So, look at your slide, whatever is your slide. Look for T, look for nuclear pleomorphism and look for mitosis. Look for tubule formation, look for nuclear pleomorphism and look for mitosis. Anyone have any confusion, please say. So out of the 3, decide your score. Out of the 3, decide your score. And here also, out of your 3, decide your score and add it. Add the 3. It can be anything. It can be 1, 1, 1. It can be 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, 3, 3, 3, 1, 1, 3, 2, 2. It can be anything. Whatever is your score, that is your final score. Minimum it is 3 and maximum it is 9. That is my point. So, minimum it is 3, maximum it is 9. How many of you got it? Based on that, we do the grading. There are 3 grades. Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. Anna, if your total, Anna, total is 3 to 5, it's grade 1. If your total is 6 to 7, it's grade 2. And what is total is 8 to 9. It's 3. It's grade 3. Minimum is 3. Maximum is 9 as I told you. How many of you got it? This is known as Bloom-Richardson scoring system. Bloom-Richardson scoring and grading system for the grading of the breast cancer. This is how we have done the grading. Here are tubules. Normal breast contain the tubules. What do you mean by tubules? So let me draw normal breast for you to explain you the tubules. Okay. So inside the breast, these are small, small glands are present. These are known as tubules. Ductules are tubules only. Okay. Normal breast have 100% tubules. Now when the cancer will occur, no? Inside this breast, when cancer is occurring, you know, so tubules get destroyed. Most of the cancer becomes solid in pattern. You know, the tubules get destroyed. If more than 75% tubules are still present, you know, it's score 1. If 10 to 75% are present, okay, it's score 2. If less than 10% are, are only left and rest all are destroyed, it's score 3. 
So this is regarding the tubules. Got it? Kiran, you got it? Others, you got it? This is how we do the grading in the breast cancer. This is known as Bloom-Richardson grading system. Okay, this is how we do the grading. Bloom-Richardson grading system. How many of you got it? Let me come on the staging. TNM staging system. Anna, staging. We are done with grading. Staging is done by clinician. What is the full form of this staging TNM? We see three things. Tumor size, nodes and metastasis. Anna, see this is the tumor. See the size of this tumor in centimeter. How many centimeter the female have tumor? The nodes, see axillary lymph nodes are involved or not involved. Number two. And look for metastasis. It is there or not there. TNM. That is the full form of TNM. We divide into, there are four T. Look for T, look for N, look for N. How many T? T1, T2, T3, T4. If the tumor is less than 2 cm, it's T1. If it is 2 to 5 cm, it's T2. If it is more than 5 cm, it's T3. Okay. And if it is extending and involving the pectoralis muscle or the skin above, the skin above and pectoralis muscle below, it is known as T4. Okay. Whatever is the size then. So less than 2 is T1. 2 to 5 is T2, more than 5 is T3 and if it is involving either pectoralis muscle below and skin above, whatever is the size, it's T4. So, decide the T for your patient, looking at the T. So, T, how you decide the T? Either by doing imaging like mammography, MRI or you can palpate it. Anna, so, that is the T for your patient, exact T. Anna, what is N? If no nodes is involved, it's N0. If regional axillary lymph nodes are involved, ipsilateral axillary, it's T1. Anna, in N2, here they are mobile, axillary. Here axillary, they become fixed. Axillary, hai hai, lekin they become fixed, it's become N2. And apart from axillary, if clavicular lymph nodes are involved, supraclavicular and infraclavicular, you can see, this is the clavicle bone. So, supra and infraclavicular lymph nodes are also involved apart from axillary, it's N3. So, decide the N for your patient. Okay, decide the N for your patient. And by doing a PET CT, you can see. And metastasis, only two options, M0 and M1. No mats and mats. Even a single mats in the liver, in the bone, in the brain, anywhere, it is considered as M1. Got my point? So, decide the T. In the T, how many options you have? Decide the N, decide the M for your patient. In the T, we have four options. T1, T2, T3, T4. What do you mean by that? Less than 2 cm is T1. 2 to 5 is T2. More than 5 is T3. And if it involves pectoralis muscle or skin, it is known as T4. Decide the N for your patient. Is it N0, N1, N2 or N3? Again, four options. N0 means no nodes are involved. N1 means axillary are involved, but they are movable. N2 means again axillary are involved, but they are fixed. And N3 means supraclavicular or infraclavicular lymph nodes are involved. Decide the M for your patient. Is it M0 or M1? Only two options. M0 means meds absent. M1 means any meds present. So, it can be anything. Hana, you can say, ma'am, my patient is T1, N1, M0. My patient is T1, N0, M0. My patient is T2, N1, M0. My patient is T3, N2, M1. Multiple combinations are possible. You got it? Based on that, we will do the staging. We have four stages in patients. Stage 1, 2, 3, 4. These are the four stages. If T1 is there and N and M are absent, no nodes, no meds, only a small less than 2 cm tumor, it's early cancer, stage 1 cancer. Stage 1 means there is only, only a tumor, less than 2 cm tumor, no nodes, no meds. Got it? That is stage 1. Okay. In stage 2, N1 is there, but meds are still absent. In stage 3, N2 or N3 is there. N2 or N3 is there, but mats are still absent. In stage 4, always mats are there. Mats are all. Whatever is the T, whatever is the N, doesn't matter. Mats matlab stage 4. Stage 4, the worst prognosis. It's metastatic, it's non-curable, it's inoperable. No surgery is done, no cure, only palliative care. How many of you got it? How many of you got it? Huh? You got it. This is TNM staging. This is TNM staging. Okay, so in the TNM staging, the nodes are very important. So what I told you till now, I told you two things. Please listen, I am summarizing. I am I'm, I'm teaching you breast cancer. I am teaching you breast cancer right now. In the breast cancer, I told you two things, staging and grading. Anna, staging and grading, both are different. Anna, most of the students get confused and they think they are synonymous. No, no, no. Staging is done by the clinician, by the physician, by the clinician, the person who is looking the patient and grading is done by the pathologist. Because grading is not done on the patient, grading is done on the microscopy of the tumor. So, the surgeon operate and give it, the send the tumor to the laboratory. So, looking at the tumor, making a slide out of it, the grading is done on the microscopy by a pathologist. Anna. So, in staging, how do you do the staging? The name of the staging system is TNM staging. 
है ना वी परफॉर्म अ स्टेजिंग विच इज नोन एस टी एन एम वॉट इज टी वॉट इज एन वॉट इज एन एम आई टोल्ड यू वेरी क्लियरली देर आर फोर टी ऑप्शन टी वन टी टू टी थ्री टी फोर डिसाइड यूर पेशन वॉट इज इट देर आर एन अगेन फोर ऑप्शन एन जीरो एन वन एन टू एन थ्री फॉर एम वी हैव ओनली टू ऑप्शन एम जीरो एंड एम वन आई होप यू अंडरस्टैंड सो यूर पेशेंट कैन हैव एनी any of uh, the combination like your patient can be t1 n0 m0 your patient can be t2 n1 m1 patient can be t3 n0 m0 t3 n1 m1 t4 you uh, know anything can be possible so based on that we have done four staging stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 it's very easy to understand stage 1 is t1 i mean the tumor is less than 2 cm okay but there are no nodes no metastasis a small tumor with no nodes no metastasis stage 1 early cancer you uh, know Cure rate is very high, more than ninety-five percent. Stage two may it can be T one or it can be T two, है ना? But it's N N one, है ना? And mats are not there. Okay. In stage three, it can be T two, T one, T two, T three, whatever. But nodes are T N two and N three, but still no mats. In stage four, it's M. Mats are present. Whatever the T, whatever the N, doesn't matter. This is how we do the staging. How many of you got it? This is known as T N M staging. For grading, we have another system. The name of the system is Bloom Richardson. pr bloom richardson bloom richardson is the name of the scientist who has given this grading system you have to look for three things here here also you can say tnm lekin the full form is different here t was tumor size here t is tubule formation look for tubule formation on the slide okay n what is n here here n was nodes here you have to look for nucleus nuclear pleomorphism look for pleomorphism ha na and uh, tnm Here M was mats. Here look for mitosis in the slide. So here we will say one two three, one two three, one two three. Decide T and M for your patient and add it. That is your final scoring. You got it. This is the Bloom Richardson scoring. Okay, got it. How many of you got it? Thank you, Marvel. Thank you so much for the compliment. How many of you got it? There is a difference between staging and grading. Don't mix up the concept. Staging is different, grading is different, है ना? So staging is done by the clinician, grading is done by the pathologist. In staging, most common use system is TNM system, and it is based on clinical grounds. Okay, grading is done on the micro microscopy ground, and it is done by the pathologist. Most common system used here is Bloom Richardson BR. So TNM staging and BR staging. How many of you got it? Please understand it very well, है ना? You get many questions on that. So this is regarding the cancer. Okay, now the first lymph node. This is a lymph. Can you see this is a tumor in the breast? In a female, this is a tumor in the breast. Look at the tumor. I'm marking with red color. This is a tumor. Okay, in the breast. You all can see. Okay. Now it spread via lymph nodes. What are the lymph nodes? You can see this is complete axillary lymph node in that lady. Ah na. So this tumor cell will migrate and involve the first lymph node. After that, second, third, fourth, the lymph nodes coming in a line. Ah na. So the first lymph node is known as sentinel lymph node. How many of you have the concept of sentinel lymph node? What is a sentinel lymph node? क्या होता है? Sentinel lymph node का मतलब क्या होता है? What do you mean by sentinel lymph node? What is sentinel lymph node? The first lymph node involved is always sentinel. The first lymph node involved is always sentinel lymph node. Can you see? This is sentinel lymph node. The first lymph node. Okay. Now, what is the relevance of this? Uh, yes, yes, Marvel. The first lymph node. What is the relevance? Now imagine you are a surgeon, you are an onco surgeon, and this lady is coming to you, doctor. I am having a mass in my breast. You have palpated, you have done a mammography, you have done a FNC, you have done a biopsy. On all the things, it's proven it's malignant. It's malignant. So obviously, what you are going to do, do the next? You are a surgeon. Now, of course, you are going to operate it. It's malignant. Come on, operate it. Anna. So you are going to operate it. You will do the surgery, of course. So in the surgery, what you are going to take out? You will say, ma'am, I will take out the tumor. Now there are two types of surgeries in the breast cancer. If the tumor is small. You will take out only the tumor. It is known as lumpectomy. It is known as lumpectomy. You are taking the lump out. Lumpectomy means you are taking the lump out. But sometimes it's very large. After taking the lump, hardly any breast is uh, uh, remaining there, है ना? So the two breast, uh, cosmetically one will be small, one will be large in the female, so it's not good. So you will take out the complete breast, complete breast, and uh, later on the prosthetic. Prosthesis will be given to the female. Prosthetic surgeries, plastic surgeries can be done later on. That is only for uh, the cosmetic purpose. If the lady is comfortable, old age, so prosthetic surgeries is not done. But in young ladies, they prefer to have a prosthetic surgery. So, anyways, that is plastic surgeries apart. I'm not interested in that. So, the complete breast removal is known as mastectomy. What is known as mastectomy means complete breast you are removing. So, lumpectomy, the lump is removed. Mastectomy, the complete breast is removed. Whatever is removed, the surgery is done. So, is it the only surgery you are going to perform? That is my question. No, you are going to remove the lymph nodes also. You cannot take the risk. 
because we know the breast cancer spread by the axillary lymph nodes. What if even a single lymph node is involved and you are leaving it behind? You are not taking the lymph node out. You are taking only tumor. So this lymph node will spread throughout the body. The tumor cells, I mean, present in that lymph node one by one, they involve all the lymph node and they go to the lymphatics and involve the entire body organs. So patient directly presents with stage four after some time. We cannot take the risk. We will remove the axillary lymph nodes also. So you will say, okay, ma'am, I will do two surgery. I will do two. I will give two incision. The first incision will be on the breast, depending on which quadrant it is. Is it lumpectomy, mastectomy, the breast surgery? And the second incision will be given in the axilla to remove the axillary lymph nodes. So it sounds good. Okay, it sounds, um, uh, you can understand that. Okay, but is the axillary lymph node is a vestigial organ? You are removing what, why the God has given this organ? Why the God has given this organ? Axillary lymph nodes you are removing now. Why God has given? The lymph nodes prevent the edema. And after the removal of axillary lymph node, the lady will present like this. And after the surgery, she will have edema of that particular arm, the right arm or left arm, whatever arm you are removing. This edema is known as lymphoedema. Lymphoedema. The edema due to removal of the lymphatics. Lymphoedema. Lymphoedema. You can say this is a morbidity of the surgery. Anna, it is not due to cancer. It is a it is a side effect of the surgery. You can say a morbidity. Of, now, agi kuma pichikai. That is the point. Now, if you leave the lymph node, patient presents with mats. Anna, stage four. And if you don't uh, leave, you are removing. The patient is presenting with lymphoedema. Anna, but with mats, life is not compatible. Patient will die. With lymphoedema, life is compatible. Patient can survive. Anna, so I will choose lymphoedema versus mats. So I will remove the axillary lymph nodes. You got my point. That is the call. We will remove the axillary lymph nodes. But before the surgery, we will counsel the patient accordingly that we are going to do two surgeries. I mean two incisions. One, your breast tumor will be removed. Second, we will give the incision in the axilla and we will remove your axillary lymph nodes. And after that, you may have lymphoedema throughout the life and it's necessary to remove it. If we leave it, you can have mats in the future. So this is the complete thing I, I explained. You got my point. How many of you got it? How many of you got it? So what if I want to prevent the lymphoedema in my patient? Huh? What if I, I want to? You will say, ma'am, don't remove the axillary lymph node. But if I don't remove, the person will present mats. Huh? So the first lymph node, the sentinel lymph node is very important here. So during the surgery, intra-op, intra-op, we can test the first lymph node. The first lymph node, the sentinel lymph node. I know. So you are a surgeon, I am a pathologist. I know. So I will also be there in the OT or nearby OT. Okay. So once you will do uh, the surgery, you will give me first lymph node and you will say me, ma'am, have a look on this lymph node and tell me whether it is involved or not involved. This is the first lymph node, the sentinel lymph node. If you say it is involved, I will remove all other lymph nodes. Anna, if you don't say it's not involved, if the first is not involved, others will also not involved. So I will leave the axillary lymph node there. So many patients can be prevented of lymphoedema by doing so. This is known as frozen section. We routinely perform frozen section in all the breast surgeries nowadays. This is the relevance of the frozen section. In the frozen section, the sentinel lymph node is tested. Whether it is involved or not involved, who tested? The pathologist. By making a slide, Anna, it is known as frozen section. So in frozen section, if the sentinel lymph node is involved, the surgeon, so report has to be generated within 5 to 10 minutes. So patient is open on OT table and within 5 to 10 minutes, the pathologist will give the report and it will inform to the surgeon. Based on that, the surgeon will take a call. Whether the axillary lymph nodes has to be removed or not removed, pack the patient, suture the patient. So that is the thing. This is frozen section. Got it? So this is all about the breast cancer. Got it? Got it? You can see. Anna, you can see this is the breast tumor. This is the breast tumor. Okay. And this is the axillary lymph node. In the axillary lymph node, it's a cluster of lymph nodes. The first lymph node which is involved is sentinel lymph node. First, the sentinel will involve and then it will spread to all others. So first check for sentinel, not for all. Got my point? Yes, the first lymph node near to the organ marble. And uh, that is the sentinel lymph node. So that is the relevance of the sentinel lymph node. This is sentinel. Okay, the first lymph node coming on the way. Got it? We are finally done with the breast cancer. I told you breast cancer is the most common cancer in females in the world. Okay, I told you. Clinical features, I told you it is a solid tree single painless mass that the female can palpate but there is no pain in that triple technique to diagnose i told you three technique number one self palpation the female can palpate that mass number two mammography has to be done if she can palpate confirm on mammography and then confirm on fnec i told you what is fnec okay and how to perform it not only this i told you the 11 risk factors for breast cancer not only this, I told you the classification of the breast cancer in, in which I have given you the detail of the four type of breast cancer. Anna, uh, ductal carcinoma in C2, we have seen the diagram. Lobular carcinoma in C2, invasive ductal carcinoma, invasive lobular carcinoma. I have given you the detail of all. 
Not only this, we have seen the molecular classification of the breast cancer also, in which I taught you four types of breast cancer, luminal A, luminal B, basal and HER2 positive. And we have seen the relevance of that. And we have seen the staging, we have seen the grading, and we have seen the relevance of the sentinel lymph node. How many of you are with me? Got it. We are done with the breast cancer. We are done with the breast cancer. And now we are going to solve some MCQs based on that. And you will give the answer. If you have understood it completely, now you will write your answer in the chat box and answer it correctly. We are done with the first cancer, breast cancer. After that, I am coming on the tumor of the brain now. Immediately after the MCQs, we will solve some MCQs now, right? So before that, let me read a very good proverb for you. Are your excuses more important than your dreams? Ask this question to yourself. What is the answer? Is it yes or no? Are your excuses more important than your dreams? Huh? No, of course not. So never excuse. Never give the excuse. Never, never, never. Always work hard. Study hard, work hard and fulfill your dreams. If your dream is to become a very good doctor, surgeon, physician, whatever, you want to do your MD or MS from one of the topmost institute of uh, the globe, of India of, or whatever country, that, that is your dream. You have to fulfill that. You have to work hard for that. Dreams don't work unless you do. I know everyone sees the dream. Everyone, I mean, imagine the dreams. But the one who works for that, that is going to fulfill. Others keep on giving the excuses. I know. So, paper was tough. I was ill. I was sick. I was having this. There was some family problem. And this, that, dash, 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 dash. Never give excuses. You can, you can give excuses to others, but not to yourself. So, be honest to yourself. Never try to give excuses for your dream. Your excuses are not important than your dream. Okay. Anyways, let's move ahead. Okay. Can we go to the next? Huh? Before that, we will solve some MCQs. So, the first question is in front of you. Read the question. Tell me the answer. Increased susceptibility of the breast cancer is likely to be associated with mutation of which gene? I told you the three genes. Huh, no? The three genes which are mutated in breast cancer. What is your answer? Is it P53? Is it P53? Is it Barca 1? What is the full form of Barca? Breast cancer 1. Is it retinoblastoma gene or is it HRAS gene? Which gene? Huh? Can you please tell me the answer? I am waiting for your answer. Can you tell me what is the correct answer? I told you three genes which are mutated. So, I told you Barca 1. Anna? I told you Barca 2. Anna? And I told you P53 also. Anna? So, Kiran, technically you are right. I told you Barca 1 and P53 also. So, ideally your answer should contain both. Na? But my point is that P53 is the most common gene among the three which is mutated. So, answer is P53 not Barca. Anna? So, Kiran, if P53 is not given in the option, then Barca is right. But currently P53 is the correct answer. How many of you got it? No, all of you are wrong. P is not the answer. The correct answer is A. P53 is the most common gene which is mutated and lead to breast cancer. I am not saying Barca 1 is not leading to. I am saying it is also mutated and leading to breast cancer. But most common is not that. Most common is P53. That's why answer is A. How many of you got it? Huh? It's good to do mistakes here but not in the exam. So correct answer is P53 not Barca. Can we go ahead? Read the next question and tell me the answer. All are risk factors for breast cancer except, I'm asking except, which of the following is not a risk factor for breast cancer? Can you please tell me what is the correct answer? Is it caffeine intake? Is it early menstruation? Is it family history? Or is it late menopause? I told you 11 risk factors, which is not a risk factor for breast cancer. Who will tell me? I guess early menarche and late menopause, both are risk factor. Family history, the first degree relative having the breast cancer, the person is at high chances of developing breast cancer. Family history is also a risk factor. But caffeine intake is no, not a risk factor. I told you in the diet, high fat, high calorie, smoking and alcohol is a risk factor. But caffeine, yani coffee is not a risk factor for breast cancer. Yes, absolutely right. So A is not a risk factor, but others are there. Let me read the next question for you. A female presented with a firm mass 2 into 2 cm in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So there is a female presented with upper outer quadrant breast cancer 2 into 2 cm. She is also having a family history of ovarian cancer to the mother or sister. Family history of ovarian cancer. Can you tell me which gene is need to be assessed for mutation in this female who is having breast cancer and having a family history of ovarian cancer? So which gene you will test for mutation? Will you test P53? Will you test Barca 2? Will you test HER2? Or will you test CMIC? Which gene you want to test in this female? Hmm? She is having two, two things. Number one, she herself has breast cancer but a family history of ovarian cancer to the mother or sister. So, of course, Barca 2 is the correct answer. You all are right. The correct answer here is Barca 2. And I told you Barca 1, Barca 2, if they are mutated, the person have breast cancer and ovarian cancer. P53 may, there is no risk of ovarian. The correct answer is Barca 2. How many of you got it? Yes, absolutely right. The next question is in front of you. 
can you tell me most common carcinoma of breast is it intraductal is it colloid is it lobular or sarcoma sarcoma phylloids what is the correct answer the most common carcinoma of the breast can you please tell me the answer what is the correct answer what is the most common carcinoma of breast i am asking yes the correct answer is intraductal anna next is bilateral breast cancer i told you which breast cancer is usually bilateral if you are getting it in one breast always rule out in other breast also look for other breast also is it medullary lobular ductal or paget i told you very clearly yes the correct answer is lobular i told you already in lobular cancer if there is a breast cancer in one right or left look the contralateral breast also i told you very clearly the next question is in front of you in which of the following the same question <clears throat> in which of the following carcinoma of the breast the biopsy of the opposite side is advised if you are getting breast carcinoma in one side the right or the left the biopsy of the opposite side is also required in which of the following breast cancer is it inflammatory medullary lobular or serous what is the correct answer yes lobular because it occurs in contralateral breast so always do the biopsy of the opposite breast also the next question what is the characteristic feature of paget cell i told you paget paget disease of nipple so what is the characteristic feature of paget cell is it eosinophilic cytoplasm abundant clear cytoplasm glycogen mass or nucleated giant cell what are paget cells the paget cells are the tumor cells which infiltrate in the skin of the nipple especially in the epidermis of the nipple and they have abundant clear cytoplasm absolutely right i told you ha na the next question what does er positive status indicate in breast cancer er positive pr positive what does it indicate is it indicating prognosis is it indicating etiology is it indicating site of the breast cancer or none of the above of course it indicates the prognosis i told you four types of breast cancer based on er pr status and her2 status and a luminal a luminal b basal that is triple negative the worst prognosis na na and the last one is her2 positive luminal a is having the best prognosis that is er pr positive but her2 negative so correct answer here is a na na the next question is which of the following is true about the infiltrating lobular carcinoma ilc is it indian file pattern is it pleomorphic cells in the sheet is it cribriform pattern or is it pinwheel pattern very peculiar question very peculiar question Yes, repeated multiple times in your exam. Repeated PYQ, the favorite question of the examiner, <laughs> which comes in your exam. Yes, you all are right. It's Indian file. What is Indian file, Doctor Miriot? What is Indian file? Yes, the uh, Clayton Firi. Of course, it will be available on the YouTube always. You can watch the recording later on also. Yes, what is the correct answer? Yes, the correct answer is Indian file pattern. Why Indian file? It is in one row. I told you the soldiers one behind the other, making a line, a straight line. that is the meaning of the indian file imagine the diagram i have told you okay coming to the next question molecular classification of the breast cancer is based on what molecular classification we divide them in four category luminal a luminal b basal the classification ka basis what is the basis is it gene expressing profile is it her2 and her2 new and erpr is it size of tumor with the lymph node or is it on the basis of the biomarker what is the correct answer yes the correct answer yes it's her2 new and erpr Yes, absolutely right. The correct answer is her two new and ERPR. Coming to the next question, sentinel lymph node biopsy in the breast cancer is done for what? Why we are doing? I told you what is sentinel lymph node just now, है ना? Is it for early diagnosis and recurrence? Is it for staging of breast cancer? Is it for frozen section or is it for occult disease detection? Why we are doing sentinel lymph node biopsy? Yes, why we are doing sentinel lymph node biopsy? The so sentinel lymph node biopsy is usually done for the frozen section hai na in the frozen section we test the first lymph node whether it is involved or not involved if it is involved we take a call to remove all other lymph nodes if it is not involved we just leave the remaining lymph nodes and the patient we are preventing the patient in that case from lymphoedema so you all are right i told you what is frozen section frozen section is intra op reporting of the um, uh, 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 lymph node by the pathologist the pathologist report it intra op the patient is open and the tat is 5 to 10 minutes within 10 minutes i have to generate the report and inform the surgeon whether that lymph node is involved or not involved in our day to day practice we perform frozen section very routinely nowadays it's a very recent technique and a latest technique and it should be performed to give the benefit to the patient otherwise if frozen section is not there imagine so always the surgeon is removing all the lymph nodes now we do not want that we want surgeon should remove the lymph node only if they are involved if they are not involved it should not be removed that is the point how many of you got it okay so can we move on the next tumor hmm I taught you the breast tumor completely. Finally, now I'm going to start the brain tumors, the important brain tumors, है ना? From histopathology point of view, I will tell you the histopathology of important brain tumors. Can we move ahead? 
Are you people with me? Before moving to the next topic, let me tell you something. Always strive for progress, not for perfection. What do you mean by that? Progress is important. Perfection is not very important. I know. I have seen the students who are um, reading the subjects, I know, or reading the topics, and they got stuck in some subject or some topic because the subject or topic topic is difficult. It's very difficult to understand, and they they got stuck there. Imagine my target today is to read three chapters. Chapter number one is very difficult, and I got stuck. I know. So what should I do? So what usually students do, they read the first chapter from multiple sources, multiple medias, multiple applications, multiple YouTube educators, different books. They just keep on reading at multiple, multiple, multiple places and they become perfect. Rather, I must say over perfect in that topic. That is not required. And what about the other two and three you have not yet touched? You have wasted your time. So rather the strategy should be your topic is 80 or 90 percent strong. It's sufficient. Don't run for 100 percent. There is no 100 percent in this world. If you look for 100% for every topic, every subject, what will happen at the end? Some are 100%, some are zero. The worst strategy. Rather, rather than st this strategy, everything is 80%, that is more functional. That is more chances you will, that will give you success. I know. So always, always strive for progress, not for perfection. If you're stuck to some topic, now leave that. You have read it once, now leave that. Whatever important questions already asked from that topic in the exam, have a look on that. If you're capable of solving that, don't go in too much detail and don't take load of that. Move to the next topic, next subject. Anna, you have to move on. Move on is important. Just keep going, keep going. Whatever problem you will tell me, I will say only one word, keep going. You will say, ma'am, there is some health problem, I will say keep going. There is some family problem, keep going. I can't concentrate, I can't study, keep going. I'm feeling depressed, keep going. The only answer in this field is keep going, keep going. You will get success. The only thing, Hannah, uh, you don't have to do stasis. The biggest mistake is the stasis. You are doing stasis anywhere. No, you have to move, move, move. Although slowly, it's okay, but you have to move. Hannah, consistency is the key. Anyways, after that, let's move ahead. Okay, let's move ahead. What you are asking, uh, uh, Dr. Prakash, multi-para reduces the risk of the breast cancer. Absolutely right. Multi-para reduces the risk of breast cancer. Okay. So, let's move ahead. Uh, tumors of the CNS. So, I am starting the tumors of the CNS now. Central nervous system. Can I start the tumors of the central nervous system? In the central nervous system, we are having two things. The brain and the spinal cord. This is brain. This is spinal cord. You can see I am drawing brain and the spinal cord. These two things constitute central nervous system. Okay. Now in the brain and the spinal cord, we have uh, two types of things. Number one, the parenchyma. The parenchyma of the brain and the spinal cord, this is parenchyma. It is made up of three types of cells. In the brain and the spinal cord, we are having three types of cells. What are the three types of cells present here? Number one, the neurons, the main cell. Anna, the main cell of the brain and the spinal cord, that is neuron. Number three, glial cells. Anna, glial cells are the supporting cells. These are the cells which support neuron. They don't transmit the signal like neuron, but they support the neuron. These are of three types. Anna, astrocyte, oligodendrocyte and ependymal cell. They support the neuron. And the third type of the cells are the macrophages in the brain, which are known as microglia. What are microglia? It's a very important question. The macrophages in the brain. So, in the brain, basically, we all have three types of cells. What are the three types of cells in brain or spinal cord? Neurons, the main cells which transmit signal. And uh, glial cells which support the neurons. And, uh, that is astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and ependymal, ependymal cells. And, uh, and microglia cells are the macrophages. These are the macrophages of the brain that is known as microglia. Right? That is the brain parenchyma. The parenchyma is made up of. Now, the brain and the spinal cord. Let me draw the brain. The brain and the spinal cord is covered by three meninges. I know. The innermost is known as pia meter. The middle one is known as arachnoid. And the outermost, just below the skull, which is known as dura meter. So, the tumor can occur in the meninges also. Okay. So, basically, in the brain, we are having two types of tumors. What are the two types of tumors in the brain? Hmm? The tumors which primarily originate in the brain and the spinal cord. These are known as primary tumor. And the tumor which are not there in the brain and spinal cord. They are somewhere else in the human body. And from there, they are metastasizing to the brain and the spinal cord. These are known as secondaries or metastatic tumors. In the brain, the secondaries are much more common than primary. And a most common tumor which is secondary, ending secondary to the brain is the lung cancer. So lung cancer sends secondaries to the brain. So, how many types of tumors are present in the brain? Please tell me. How many types of tumors are present in the brain? In the brain or the spinal cord? The primary and the secondary. 
what are primary tumors that originate in the brain and spinal cord only and what are secondary they are not originating in the brain and the spinal cord they are somewhere else in the body and via blood or lymphatic it is migrating to the brain and forming multiple secondaries there these are known as metastatic which is more common in the brain or spinal cord the primary or the secondary secondaries are more common the metastatic tumors are more common so metastatic tumors or the secondaries are more common okay secondaries to the brain are much more common okay so secondaries are more common tumors and most common tumor which sends secondary to the brain is the lung followed by breast so lung tumor sends secondary followed by breast send secondary to the brain these all are your question now coming on primary breast tumor here i am interested in the primary breast, breast tumor not the primary brain tumor give me a minute here i am interested in the primary brain tumor not the secondaries okay let me tell you the primary brain tumor we divide them in four categories the tumor of the glial the tumor of the neural and the tumor of the meninges i told you what are neural neural tumors the neural tumors arise arise in the neuroma uh, 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 neurons you know the main uh, signaling cells so they can be ganglioneuroma gangliocytoma neurocytoma and dysembryo dysembryonic uh, neuroepithelial tumors so these are the four type of neural tumors you have okay in the glial in the glial these are the tumors of the supporting cell how many type of glial cells i told you three type of supporting cells astrocytes have tumor astrocytoma oligodendrocytes have tumor oligodendroglioma and ependymal cells have tumor ependymoma so it is astrocytoma oligodendroglioma ependymoma okay after that the third category is the undifferentiated tumors the undifferentiated tumors are medulloblastoma the most common one and meningeal tumors arising in the meninges i told you the three meninges na pyometer followed by arachnoid followed by duramater so if tumor occurs in the meninges is the meningeum right so these all are your tumors in your syllabus but among them i am going to teach you four the ultra important from exam point of view so i will teach you glial tumors all three type of glial i will teach you i will teach you astrocytomas i will teach you oligodendrogliomas i will teach you ependymal tumors right now all three type of glial tumors i will teach you meningiomas also the tumor of the meninges okay i will teach you medulloblastoma also not only this we have nerve now how does a nerve is there this is a nerve now the nerve is surrounded by myelin sheath and right? myelin sheath you know so sheath nerve sheath tumors are also there the peripheral nerve sheath tumors the tumors in the myelin sheath these are schwannomas so i am going to teach you schwannomas also got it so how many tumors we are going to cover glioma meningioma medulloblastoma and schwannoma so in your exam definitely you are going to get questions from them and other important brain tumors say yes got it how many of you got it so one by one we will take these tumors and complete it first of all i will take glioma i request you to study the glioma with me what are glioma first tell me what are glioma you will say ma'am glioma are the tumor of the brain which arise from glial cell so i will ask you the next question what is glial cell so you will say ma'am glial cell are the supporting cells to the neuron these are not not neuron they do not transmit signal like neuron ha na these they support neuron and these are of three type astrocyte oligocyte oligodendrocyte and ependymal cell so tumor can occur in any of them astrocyte tumor is known as astrocytoma oligodendrocyte tumor is known as oligodendroglioma and ependymal cell tumor is known as ependymoma how many of you got it ha na not only this the astrocytomas are of four types grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 and grade 4 grade 1 is known as pilocytic astrocytoma this is ultra important it occurs in children and grade 4 is known as gbm glioblastoma multiforme you have to learn the names first ha na it is very important it occurs in adults so among the astrocytoma out of the four i will teach you first and fourth second and third are not very important you can skip you just know the classification at your level it's more than sufficient so there are four type of astrocytoma Anna, so basically, I want you to take one blank page right now. Take out your notebook, take out your pen, take one blank page, divide it into four columns. Anna, first, I first down, write down pilocytic astrocytoma. Then write down GBM, grade four, that is glioblastoma multiforme. So these are two astrocytoma. Then oligodendroglioma and then ependymoma. I want you to do like this. Anna, these are the glial tumors. I am going to explain you. Out of the four astrocytoma, I will take one and four. out of the four i will take one and four i repeat out of the four i am taking only one and four not two and three this is grade 1 pilocytic astrocytoma this is grade 4 gbm glioblastoma multiforme children and adult all oh, astrocytomas are done out of four we are doing two after that oligodendroglioma and ependymoma so these are the glial tumors let's finish glial tumors on one page how many of you are with me can we continue the glial tumors on one page can we continue say yes Anna, so we are starting and doing the glial tumors. Anna, 
So I want you to write down the site in the brain, most common site, cerebrum, cerebellum, basal. So where does they occur? The gross important finding and most important draw microscopy. Don't write. I insist the word draw. Please draw the microscopy of all four. You get many questions on that. Can we start? Can we start? Start with the first one, pilocytic astrocytoma. Rather start, okay. After that, I will teach you meningioma, medulloblastoma and schwannoma. Also on other page, we will see that. Let's first finish the glial tumors. Let's start glioma. The most common tumor in the brain is glioma. Okay. So most common, I am going to teach you gliomas also, meningioma also, medulloblastoma also, schwannoma also. Most common tumor in the brain is glioma. But gliomas of three types, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma and ependymoma. So which is most common? So astrocytoma is the most common tumor in the brain. Among the glioma, the most common is astrocytoma. But you will see ma'am, astrocytoma is also of four types. Type 1, type 2, type 3, so type 4. So in children, type 1 most common. In adult, type 4 is most common. Anna? But astrocytoma is the most common tumor of the brain. It is one of the glial tumor. Among all the tumor, glial is most common or glial may be astrocytoma is most common. That is the point you have to understand. So let's start the gliomas, the first tumor of the brain, the brain tumors we will cover. In the most simplified, in a comparative manner, we will pack the seven tumors I am going to teach you back to back. We will draw this table. I request the students, whatever you are watching me live or later recorded on, recorded version, please take out your notebooks and pen right now and make this table with me. Once you will make now your complete brain tumor on two pages, that's it. You can revise before your exam anytime, just in one minute. Yes, believe me. So take out and please write down. So first page is glioma. Anna. So I will teach you glioma. I will teach you meningioma. I will teach you medulloblastoma. I will teach you schwannoma. In the glioma, I will teach you three gliomas. Astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma and ependymoma. Anna. Astrocytoma arises from astrocyte. Oligodendroglioma arises from oligodendrocytes and ependymoma arises from ependymal cells. Okay, astrocytoma are of four types, but in our syllabus only two are important, one and four. Two and three are not important. The one is known as pilocytic astrocytoma, the four is known as GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. So let's take glioma on one page, finish them, and on another page, let's take the remaining three, medulloblastoma, meningioma, and schwannoma. So total seven I'm going to teach you. Let's first finish glioma. I hope you got the orientation. Yes. So yes, Monica, you got the orientation. Others, can we start? Let's start glioma. Gliomas are the tumors which arises from the neuroglia, the supporting cells. There are three types of gliomas I already told you. Astrocytoma arises from astrocyte. Oligodendroglioma arises from oligodendrocyte. And ependymoma arises from ependymal cells. I already told you. Now let's start astrocytoma. Astrocytoma is the most common glial tumor. What is the most common brain tumor? Say astro, uh, glioma. What is the most common glioma? Astrocytoma. So finally, astrocytoma is the most common brain tumor. It is of four types. But I will teach you only two. But it is of four types. You must understand. Grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 and grade 4. I want you, I want you to learn their other names. Okay, to learn their other names. Grade 1 is known as pilocytic. Grade 2 is known as fibrillary. Grade 3 is known as anaplastic. And grade 4 is known as glioblastoma multiforme GBM. Okay, so that is the four types. And I will teach you one and four. One, which is more common in children. Two, which is most common in adults. Uh, four, which is most common in adults, not two and four. Can we start? So let's start with grade one, astrocytoma, pilocytic astrocytoma. As I told you, it occurs in children only. Write the age. Anna, it occurs in cerebellum here. Cerebellum and the brain stem. Anna, not in the cerebrum. Please mind. It occurs in cerebellum. You will get a clue. There is a child, four-year child presented with a cerebellar mass. So you are getting two clues. There is a child and cerebellar mass. Okay. Cerebellum and brain stem, they occur. The prognosis is very good. And a surgical treatment, 100% possible. 100% we can resect it out. Thankfully, in children, it's having good prognosis. Grossly, the tumor is well circumscribed. You can see the margin and it is gelatinous. You know, it's cystic and having a mucoid, mixoid, gelatinous appearance. You can cut out. In the surgery, the, the surgeon can cut it out completely, 100% resection. Possible and prognosis is very good. This is gross. Okay. Microscopically, this is the diagram. In the diagram, you can see only one abnormal finding. You can see pink color fibers inside the tumor. Rest of the brain is normal. The fibrillary background, it's normal. Rest of the brain is normal. You can see the neurons, oligodendrocyte cells. But these fibers are abnormal. What are these fibers? The pink color fibers are known as rosenthal fibers. What they are known as? Please say the word. It's rosenthal fiber. What are rosenthal fiber? These are inclusion bodies. These are the inclusion bodies. Anna, the pink color inclusion body, bodies made up of GFAP protein. Anna, 
These are made up of GAP, GAPP protein accumulate together and form the pink color inclusion bodies that is rosenthal fiber. That is the hallmark of this tumor. So, in this tumor, you get the rosenthal fiber and right? on microscopy that is intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies which are made up of GFAP protein. What is GFAP protein? GFAP protein normally present in the brain. That is glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP. And P53 mutations are common here. That is grade 1. Coming on grade 4 astrocytoma. One ki but directly 4. And right? 2, 3 are not important. I am saying again and again. So, coming on grade 4. Grade 4 is known as GBM, glioblastoma multiforming. It's known as GBM, glioblastoma multiforming. It occurs in old age after 60 years. That was occurring in children. This is occurring in old age. Uh, grade 1 was occurring in cerebellum and brainstem. I told you, this one occurs in cerebrum. In the cerebrum, which hemisphere? Temporal and frontal. You get questions on that. Frontal and temporal. Frontal and temporal hemisphere. But in cerebrum, not in cerebellum. Right, it is having poor prognosis. That was having good prognosis. This one having very poor prognosis. Grossly, remember grade 1, it was well circumscribed, myxoid, cystic in appearance. This one variegated. Variegated means multiple type of uh, areas are there. Some areas are fleshy, some areas are uh, grayish white, some areas are firm, some areas are whitish. Areas of hemorrhage and necrosis are very common. Hemorrhage, necrosis and it is usually butterfly shape. By butterfly shape, I see it is crossing the midline. That was present on one side, either right or left. This is crossing the midline. Crossing midline is very common, butterfly shape. I am talking about the grade 4 astrocytoma. Okay, that is GBM. See the diagram. Don't read the microscopy. I never read the microscopy. I look in the diagram itself. Please look. You have a better pictorial memory. And a pictographic memory is more strong as compared to textual. If I show you something in the form of the text and I ask you to learn it, you will forget. But if I show you something in the image, now better chances of retention. So, always try to see maximum things in pathology in the form of the diagram. Okay. Here, this is a diagram of GBM. Grade 4, astrocytoma, that is glioblastoma multiforme. You can see, I can see, what I can see here? Necrosis. Abundant of necrosis. And the tumor cells are arranged around the necrosis. This is known as pseudopalisading. This is known as pseudopalisading necrosis. Here, the you can see the serpentile necrotic areas. The border of which containing the tumor cells. This is known as pseudo palisading necrosis, which is very frequent here. Number two, you can see the tumor cells are very much pleomorphic. Some are small, some are large. So, variation in size is very common. So, necrosis is common, mitosis is common, pleomorphosis, pleomorphism is common. And you can see the capillaries. Can you see these all are capillaries? Tumor is very vascular, abundant of capillaries are there. Can you see? So, there, this is known as microvasculature. Microvascular endothelial proliferation is common. So, that is the findings in, you can see the findings in grade 4 uh, astrocytoma. That is GBM. Now, coming on oligodendroglioma. Oligodendroglioma occurs in the white matter. You know, not in gray matter, in the white matter of the cerebral. They also occur in the cerebral hemisphere, but in white matter, not in gray matter. Grossly, it is like a gelatinous mass. Take the word gelatinous. It is like a gel-like and a gelatinous mass is there. And, uh, and microscopically, all the cells are uniform. Can you see oligodendroglioma? All the cells are uniform. Can you make out? All the cells are uniform. The peculiar thing, if you see any of the tumor cell here, you can see this is a nucleus, this is a nucleoli and this is the cytoplasm. Let me draw it. This is the cytoplasm of the cell. This is the nucleus of the cell having a nucleoli inside that. Where is the cytoplasm? The cytoplasm is present at the periphery. Around the nucleus, there is a clear halo. Can you see around the nucleus, there is a clear halo. So, it is known as clear halo around the nucleus, perihalar halo. It is giving a fried egg appearance. Have you ever tried to hatch an egg and on a pan? Can you see a yellow at the center and white all around? It is looking like that because of the perinuclear halo, which is the hallmark here. It is known as fried egg appearance. See the appearance. It's fried egg. The tumor cells are round to oval and they are surrounded by a clear halo. Anna, it is known as fried egg appearance and calcifications are very common. Can you see the calcifications in this diagram? Where are the calcification? I can see one here, one here. This is all bluish calcification. Calcification in pathology is basophilic mass. And a basophilic mass. It is all calcification. You got it? So, calcifications are very common here. Got it? Just a second. Let me erase it and go ahead. Okay. So, calcifications are very common here. So, that is oligodendroglioma. What we have learned in oligodendroglioma, what are the important points? The cells are uniform. Pride egg appearance and calcification. That is oligodendroglioma. The last one is ependymoma. What is the last one here? Can you please tell me what is the last one, please? 
ependymoma so i told you there are three type of neuroglial glial tumors astrocytoma oligodendroglioma ependymoma i already taught you two types of astrocytoma grade 1 that is pilocytic and we have seen that and grade 4 that is gbm glioblastoma multiforme we have already seen that oligodendroma we have already seen that now the last one among the glial tumors i am teaching you is ependymoma then we will complete the table ependymoma everyone see the ependymoma ependymoma arises from ependymal cells ependymal cells you know in the brain we have ventricles in the ventricles the lining of the ependymal cells form the csf the ventricles the first second third ventricle they are filled with csf i know so who is forming csf in the ventricle the ependymal cells the ependymoma is a tumor of the ependymal cells that lines the ventricle and the central canal in the spinal cord it occurs in young usually less than 20 years mein hota hai. I know. most common site it occurs around the ventricles in the ventricles you can see this one well demarcated tumor in the ventricle microscopically very unique this is ependymoma this is ependymoma where are the tumor cells and how they are arranged here you can see two things rosette and pseudo rosette what is a rosette and what is a pseudo rosette see i will draw i know there is a blood vessel at the center this is a blood vessel and this is nothing at the center no nothing so tumor cells if they are arranged around the blood vessel it is known as a rosette and if they are surround an empty space it is known as pseudo rosette so there are rosettes and and there are pseudo rosettes please understand the meaning of the rosettes and pseudo rosette in the rosette the lumen contain the blood vessel in the pseudo rosette so lumen contain nothing the tumor surround an empty space you can say now the tumor has cilia the tumor has the cilia the cilia is projecting like this can you see in this space the cilia is coming the cilia of the tumor cells is coming here also here also the cilia is coming all around okay this is cilia of the tumor which is coming in the center this is known as blepharoplast blepharoplast okay the cilia is coming so this is typically can you see let me draw you all can see this is a blood vessel appreciate the blood vessel and here nothing is present it's empty okay where are the tumor cells these all are tumor cells lining around the blood vessel so i must say this is a rosette i am drawing right now and i must say this is a pseudo rosette i am drawing right now this is a pseudo rosette Anna? in both of them i can appreciate this is the pink color cilia that is blepharoplast it is projecting in the lumen you all got it so please there are rosettes there are pseudo rosette in both of them the blepharoplast that is cilia from the tumor cell is projecting in the lumen how many of you got it how many of you got it monica prakash others everyone got it so this is the microscopy of the ependymoma we are done with glial tumors so ultimately i want all of you to make this table like this i know so what are the glial tumors how many glial tumors are there in our syllabus three astrocytoma oligodendroma glioma and ependymoma there are two type of astrocytomas oligodendroglioma and ependymoma the three types of glial tumors the two astrocytomas grade 1 that is pilocytic and grade 4 that is gbm got it so please say their site in the brain where does they occur because it will give you a clue in the exam you will get a question there is a there is a there is a child having tumor in the cerebellum write down this one occur in children write down this one occur in adults this one occur in any age group and this one occur less than 20 years so age will give you a clue in a big clinical question number one and number two the site will give you the clue right here it is cerebellum here it is cerebral hemisphere especially frontal and temporal okay here also cerebral cortex but the white matter and here it, it is usually in the ventricles in the brain especially fourth ventricle Anna? and see the gloss is not very important but microscopy of all of them is ultra important the microscopy is ultra important here the microscopy is the rosenthal fiber instead of writing draw it what are rosenthal fiber i told you these are the intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies made up of gfap protein gfap protein ki pink color ki inclusion bodies are. okay here in GBM, I told you what is pseudo palisading. The tumor cells surround themselves around the necrosis. Mitosis is common, pleomorphism is common. In oligodendroglioma, I told you fried egg appearance. You remember I told you, and around the nucleus, there is a perinuclear halo. And calcifications are common. And in ependymoma, rosettes, pseudo rosettes, along with blepharoplast is common. You can imagine, close your eyes and imagine the four diagrams just now I show you. So instead of writing and learning these words, show them in the diagram, you will never forget. That is the point. Anna, please imagine the diagram or rather draw the four diagrams here. Draw a diagram and show Rosenthal fiber, pink color here. Draw a diagram and show the pseudopolysetting here. Draw central necrosis, the tumor cells are surrounding that. 
Draw a diagram and show all the cells which are uniform with fried egg appearance. Draw a diagram, draw one rosette, one pseudo rosette. I told you how to draw with the blepharoplast coming at the center. How many of you got it? Ayush, you got it? Monica, got it? Prakash, can we proceed? Huh? So this is how you have to complete all the glial tumors. We have done the glial tumors, the two types of astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, ependymoma. I don't think you have any single confusion in that. Anna, the main is the microscopy. Anna, you have to take the catchy catchy words in each microscopy. Now, among other brain tumors, I'm not going to teach you neural, neuronal tumors. They are not important in your syllabus. Medulloblastoma, meningioma and schwannoma. Three more we have to cover. So let's come on meningioma. The next one is the meningioma. Let's come on the next one, meningioma. Kiran, you want to see rosenthal fibers? Give me a minute. Let me go back to show you. This is rosenthal. This is rosenthal fiber. Kiran, this is rosenthal fiber. Oh, no. So, rosenthal fiber is a pink color fiber. Can you see these all are pink color? These are the inclusion bodies. Oh, no. These are made up of GFAP protein, glial fibrillary acidic protein. They just accumulate and form the pink color elongated masses. These are known as rosenthal fiber. Got it? Can we go ahead? Huh? So, let's come on meningioma now. Oh, no. So, next tumor here is meningioma. Let's start meningioma. What is meningioma? Meningioma is a tumor arising from the meninges. I told you this is the skull, this is the brain, okay, and this is the skull, skull bone. You can see this is skull, and below that we have brain. This is the brain. So there are three meninges surrounding the brain. Can you tell me the names, please? The innermost is the pia meter, which is adhered to the brain parenchyma, closely adhered to the brain parenchyma. That is the innermost one, right? The middle one, the middle one is the arachnoid. Okay, this one is arachnoid and the outermost one is the, this one is the outermost one. This is durameter. Let me write down. Anna, so, this is pyameter, this is arachnoid and this is durameter. Can you see the spaces? Anna, so, there is a space above dura and below dura. Above dural space is epidural space and below dural space is subdural space. Okay, and there is a space between the pi and arachnoid, just below the arachnoid. This is subarachnoid space. So, read the three spaces. In front of you, you are given the three spaces. Epidural, subdural and subarachnoid. These are the three spaces you can see. Anna. So, CSF is present in the subarachnoid. Currently, I am talking about meningioma. Let's come on the topic meningioma. Meningioma is a tumor of the meninges. Meningioma is a tumor of meninges. Anna. Which meninge? Especially, it occurs in the arachnoid. Anna. Arachnoid meninges. Anna. So, the same thing. It arises from the arachnoid, the cap cell layer of the arachnoid. Very important question. Right. It can occur anywhere, but usually it occurs over the cerebral convexities. Okay. It is usually solitary, single, single. But when it is associated with neurofibromatosis, now it is multiple. If it is associated with neurofibromatosis, it is multiple. And it occurs in second to sixth decade of life. Okay. And it is more common in females. That is the introduction in meningioma. It is usually benign, but rarely it converts into malignancy also. Okay. You can see the gross. It is well circumscribed of varying size. Gross is, gross is nothing important. Microscopy is very peculiar. Can you see this is microscopy of meningioma. Appreciate meningioma. This is the microscopy of the meningioma. Can you all appreciate? In the meningioma, there is a samoma body at the center. Can you see this is the samoma body? I know what is samoma body? Samoma body is calcification. I told you calcification in oligodendroglioma also right now. But here the calcification have a peculiar thing. It is arranged in whorls. Can you see in concentric rings? The calcification is arranged in concentric rings. The concentric ring calcification is known as samoma. P is silent. Don't call it the samoma. The P is silent. Hana? Call it samoma bodies. In the samoma bodies, the calcification is in whorls. Appreciate the calcification is in whorls. Hana? So samoma body is present at the center. And the tumor cells are spindeloid in shape. You can see these are spindle shaped tumor cells. And they surround the samoma bodies like this. They surround the samoma bodies like this. So the samoma bodies are surrounded Anna, by spindle tumor cells. The tumor cells are also arranged in world pattern. The tumor cells are also arranged in world pattern. Multiple tumor cells. Anna, let me draw a samoma body here. And let me draw a few tumor cells for you. This is a tumor cell with a nucleus. This is a tumor cell. So multiple tumor cells sometimes fuses with each other having multiple nucleus. It fuses. So, fusion of the tumor cell with each other is known as syncytial. 
है ना सेंसाइशल ट्यूमर सेल्स आर कॉमन हियर हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू गॉट इट हाँ तो प्लीज लर्न दिस इज दिस इज ऑल अबाउट द मैनेजूमा इन द मैनेजूमा टू थिंग्स आर कॉमन सामोमा बॉडीज एट द सेंटर एंड ट्यूमर सेल्स सराउंड दैट फॉर्मिंग अ वर्ल्ड पैटर्न एंड सेंसाइशियम इज कॉमन गॉट इट वी आर डन विद मैनेजूमा कमिंग ऑन मेड्यूलो ब्लास्टोमा द नेक्स्ट वन वी विल मेक अ टेबल बिटवीन दैम ऑल्सो So coming on the next one, the next one is the medulloblastoma. The next one is the medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma exclusively occur in cerebellum. Please see, like type one astrocytoma, है ना? That occurs in children, right? So like pilocytic astrocytoma, it occurs also, also exclusively occurs in cerebellum. It also occurs in children, not in adult. You have questions on all these. It is an undifferentiated tumor of the brain. And it's very radio sensitive. The medulloblastoma. In the introduction, you have to write the important important points, please. And in the introduction, got my point? Now, gross is not very important. You can skip. Microscopy is ultra important. Can you see the microscopy? Here also the rosettes I can see. I have seen the rosettes where in ependymoma. These were the rosettes and pseudo rosettes. And now, so in ependymoma, I told you either the tumor contain a blood vessel or it contain nothing. And the tumor cells surround either a blood vessel. It is a real rosette, true rosette. And if it is surround the empty space, it is known as pseudo rosette. Here I am saying in medulloblastoma, in the center there is a pink color material neuropil, and the tumor cells surround that. The tumor cells surround neuropil, neuropil. What are the surrounding? Neuropil. And this this rosette is known as Homer Wright rosette. It is not rosette. It is not pseudo rosette. It is known as Homer Wright rosette. Highlight the word. Very important finding. Homer Wright rosette. The name of the scientist who discovered that. And all of them see the tumor cell. These are the tumor cells. They are surrounding something. These are the tumor cells. They are surrounding something at the center. They are forming small, small rosettes. Rosettes means flower-like structure. The meaning of the rosette is the flower-like structure. Can you see? These all are rosettes. What is present at their center? In all of them, you can see the center contain a pink color material. That is known as neuropil. I know. And that is the first thing. I know. Now see any of the tumor cell. Look at any of the tumor cells. The tumor cells are small, round, blue cells. I know they are very small. Look like small lymphocytes. So that is the second uh, peculiarity. Got it? So small, round, blue tumor cells are present that surround the pink area. That is neuropil at the center. This is known as Homer Wright rosette. How many of you got it? Homer Wright rosette is a hallmark of medulloblastoma that occurs in children exclusively in cerebellum radio sensitive tumor. The last brain tumor I am going to teach you is the nerve sheath tumor. That is schwannoma. Schwannoma is a tumor of the nerve sheath, the myelin sheath. This is the nerve. Over the nerve we have myelin sheath. So this is the myelin sheath. So schwannoma is a tumor arising in the sheath and compressing the nerve. It's always eccentric, and it's always eccentric on the nerve. It compresses the nerve. Got it? It arises from the nerve sheath. How many of you got it? So what are schwannoma? Let me come on the schwannomas. Schwannomas are neurolymomas. What are schwannomas? They are neurolymomas, right? Also known as, I mean, its other name. They are arising from the cranial and spinal nerves. They are arising from cranial nerve and spinal nerve. They are solitary. They are usually solitary and they are eccentric. If they are associated uh, with von Drucklinson disease, they are multiple. Otherwise, they are solitary. I told you they are arising from nerves, no? They are the myelin sheath of the nerves. How many cranial nerves we have? How many spinal nerves we have? We have twelve pairs of cranial nerves and thirty-three pairs. I know uh, 31 pairs of the spinal nerve. So in the cranial nerve, it is arising from the eighth nerve most commonly. That is acoustic, acoustic schwannoma. The eighth nerve, the eighth nerve schwannoma are most important, most common. I mean, so please learn. It is also known as acoustic schwannoma. You see, this is a diagram. Can you all see the diagram? In the diagram, make out the nerve. This is the nerve. I know, and make out the tumor. This is the complete tumor arising from the sheath of the nerve, compressing the nerve eccentric. So it is always encapsulated. I can see the capsule well. <laughs> These are in uh, eccentric. Do not infiltrate inside the nerve. You know, the nerve ke andar nahi gusenge. This is the nerve, and this is the myelin sheath. So this is a tumor arising in that. So they do not infiltrate. They just compress the nerve. They do not infiltrate inside that. That is the gross. Microscopy is very unique. See the microscopy. In the microscopy, we are having two areas: Antony A, Antony B. What is Antony A, Antony B area? Can you see this diagram? In this diagram, can you see this area? It is hypercellular, Anna. Can you see this is hypocellular? This is again hypercellular. This is again. So we can see alternate hyper hypo, hyper hypo, hypercellular area which is containing multiple cells. It is known as Antony A. Antony A is an area which is hypercellular and hypocellular loose cells are there hardly any cell. It is Antony B. 
So basically, schwannoma is a tumor in which alternate there is hypercellular and hypocellular areas. Anna? Hypercellular areas are known as Antony A and hypocellular areas are known as Antony B. Kiran, eccentric means it's not at the center, it's at the side. It is at the side of the nerve and compressing the nerve. It's not at the center of the nerve. Since it is not a tumor of the nerve, it is a tumor of the nerve sheath. That is the meaning of that. Kiran, got it? I know. So I told you here in Schwannoma, we are having two areas, Antony A and Antony B. Antony A is the hypercellular area and Antony B is hypo. Yes, hyper, hypo, hyper, hypo. So that is alternate. I know. Come on the hypercellular Antony A area. Look at the Antony A. You can see these all are tumor cells in the Antony A. See the nucleus. The nucleus arranged one behind the other like a step ladder. Can you see? The nucleus is arranged one behind the other like this. The nucleus is arranged one behind the other like this. Like this. It is known as Veruque body. It is known as palisading nucleus. What is known as? The nucleus is palisading. It is known as Veruque body. Very important question. Veruque bodies are seen in answer is schwannoma. Veruque bodies are seen in schwannoma. Okay. So in Antony A, the hypercellular areas are there. The nucleus is palisading one behind the other and it is known as Veruque body. Okay. And Antony B area is very loose and acellular. Got my point? Got my point? Say yes. So the three type of the tumors are in front of you. We have covered Anna, meningioma, medulloblastoma, schwannoma. Tell me their most common site. Huh? Meningioma arises from the Meninges, which manage arachnoid, the cap layer cells of the arachnoid and more, more common at the cerebral surfaces. Medulloblastoma arises from the cerebellum and schwannoma arises from the nerves, which now? Eighth nerve, a caustic. And a vestibulo cochlear both, but more common in the cochlear component. Okay, so that is the thing. And we go ahead. Huh? Gross is not very important, but microscopy take the peculiar words. Rather than learning the microscopy, I prefer to draw it. In Manijuma, draw a Samuma body and surrounding it in the world pattern, draw the tumor cells which are spindle, spindle shape. In Medulloblastoma, draw Homer right rosette, in which in the center draw pink color material and draw small round blue tumor cells surrounding the pink color material. That is Homer right rosette. In the Schwannoma, draw hyper and hypocellular area. The hypercellular area are Antony A and hypocellular area are Antony B. The Antony A are hypercellular area, Anna. And they contain the nucleus and palisading arrangement. One behind the other is known as Veruke body. And in Antony B, it's loose area. How many of you got it? Huh? Rather than writing, you will forget. Draw it, you will not forget. So draw the boxes. Inside that, draw the finding which I have written here. It will be much better for you. Anna, and we have already covered the gliomas. Let's revise them also. I have covered three types of gliomas. Pilocytic astrocytoma. GBM, these are the two astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma and ependymoma. I want you to highlight their peculiar, peculiar finding. Microscopy of all of them should be highlighted. They all have some or other peculiar finding in their microscopy. How many of you got it? Huh? So, total seven tumors I taught you. What are the seven tumors I taught you? Can we revise them quickly? Pilocytic astrocytoma I taught you, the first one. Just a second. Pilocytic astrocytoma, the first one. GBM. The second one, oligodendroglioma. The third one, ependymoma. The fourth one, meningioma. The fifth one, Anna, medulloblastoma. The sixth one, and finally, schwannoma. The last one. I want you to compare them all in one page or two page. Anna, I want you to write down the age specific for each of them, the site in the brain specific for each of them, and the most important is the microscopy of each of them. Draw it. Draw it. So, in pilocytic astrocytoma, can you please tell me what is the important point here? Anna, I am right. I am writing, but you have to draw it. So, write down, instead of um, uh, writing, draw rosenthal fiber. Rosenthal fibers here. Okay, pilocytic astrocytoma, draw the rosenthal fiber. That is ultra important. What is rosenthal fiber? It's inclusion, inclusion body made up of GFAP protein. Okay, in GBM, draw pseudo palisading arrangement. The tumor cells are arranged in pseudo palisading arrangement. There is a central necrosis, there is mitosis, there is pleomorphism. In oligodendroglioma, all the cells are uniform and they have fried egg appearance and calcifications are very common. In ependymoma, two things are common, rosette and pseudo rosette. You know the difference between them. Anna, and blepharoplasts are there. The blepharoplasts are the cilia going in rosette, pseudo rosette. I want you to imagine the diagram I have shown you. In meningioma, I told you there is samoma body at the center. Samoma body. And the samoma body is surrounded by the tumor cells which are world in appearance and they are arranged in 
uh, which are spindle shaped in appearance and they are in bald pattern. In medulloblastoma, again, Homer right rosettes is the hallmark, hallmark there, hai na? in which there is a pink color material at the center surrounded by small round blue cells. And in the schwannoma, I told you Antony A and Antony B areas. Antony A is hypercellular, Antony B is hypocellular. In Antony A, you have Veruke body. How many of you got it, Veruke body? So you have to learn the one, 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 two, one, two, catchy, catchy words and all the tumor and try to draw it. You definitely get question on either microscopy or you will get a question on the agent site. Agent site will be give, given in the form of the clue. Can we solve some MCQs based on that? Can we solve some MCQs based on the brain tumors? We are done with brain tumors. How many of you are with me? Are you ready? Give me a thumbs up. Come on. Can we start? Okay. Before that, let me tell you something. Nothing will feel you better except than doing work. I have seen the student, they always search for seek for motivation, motivation. They always say, ma'am, I'm lack of motivation. Give me some motivational speech, some motivational course so that I get motivated and start studying. I know. So they just keep on trying this, trying that. But let me tell you, nothing will feel you better. Kitna bhi motivational speech sun lo. Achha nahi lagega jab tak padhoge nahi. I know. So you have to do the work. Now always try to see the day you more work, the day you feel more happy. The day you, you feel, you study more. That day you are more happy, more motivated, more happy and more concentrated. The day you are wasting time now, you are wasting time watching movie, roaming here and there. But from inside, somehow you feel bad that you are doing something wrong. So that is the thing. I know. So, okay, let's solve some MCQs now. The first question is in front of you. Tell me the most common site of glioblastoma multiforme. Who will tell me? GBM, the most common site. Fast. GBM, the most common site of GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. That is, I am asking grade 4 astrocytoma. I am waiting for your answer. Is it CP angle? Is it frontal lobe? Is it brain stem or occipital lobe? I told you the grade 4 astrocytoma, they are common in cerebrum. Grade 1 are common in cerebellum and brain, brain stem. Yes, cerebral. So, cerebral me where, Monica? I told you, na, frontal and temporal lobe. Among them, the option frontal lobe is there. Go with frontal lobe. And the cerebrum, I told you it's frontal. No, 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 it's not brain stem, Ayush. I told you it's frontal and temporal lobe in the notes also you can see. Okay. In the cerebrum, it's frontal and temporal lobe. Go with frontal lobe. The next question is in front of you. Which of the following brain tumor arises from arachnoid cell? Which of the following brain tumor arises from arachnoid cell? Very easy question. Na? Arachnoid kya hai? What is arachnoid? Is it medulloblastoma, ependymoma, meningioma or glioma? Obviously, it's meningioma. It is one of the meninges. Arachnoid. Pyometer, arachnoid and duromitor. So, they are arising from meningioma. The meningioma arises from arachnoid capsules. The next question. Rosenthal fibers are seen in which tumor? Brain tumor. Is it pilocytic astrocytoma? Is it glioblastoma multiforme? Is it medulloblastoma or ependymoma? Yeah, easy question. Please everyone participate. Na? Rosenthal fiber is a hallmark of grade 1 astrocytoma, also known as pilocytic astrocytoma. Very good, which occurs in children. Very good prognosis. 100% surgically resection. It is made up of GFAP protein. Anna? And these are the inclusion bodies. Okay. Yes, you all are right. Very good. The next question, Samoma bodies are seen in which brain tumor? Pilocytic astrocytoma, glioblastoma multiforme, medulloblastoma or meningioma. Samoma bodies. Anna, the central blue color, uh, co-centric calcification surrounded by tumor cells. Hmm? Samoma bodies. They are common in meningioma. They are common in meningioma. Yes. Kenshin mad. Yes, absolutely right. They are common in meningioma just now. Monica, absolutely right. Anna? The next question, Veruke bodies. Just now I taught you, Veruke bodies. The palisading arrangement of the nucleus, one behind the other like a step ladder. It is seen in which tumor? Is it pilocytic astrocytoma, glioblastoma, multiforme, medulloblastoma or schwannoma? You have to take the catchy catchy word. Kis tumor mein kya catchy word hai? I told you Antony A, Antony B, hyper, hypocellular. Hypercellular mein the nucleus and palisading pattern. So in which tumor I told you Antony A, Antony B? Yes, again the correct answer is schwannoma. So Veruke bodies are seen in Antony A area of schwannoma. Okay, the next question, fried egg appearance of the cell. And calcification is common in which tumor? Is it pilocytic astrocytoma, glioblastoma, oligodendroglioma or medulloblastoma? Yes, fried egg appearance and the calcification. Yes, I am asking fried egg appearance. So, there is a nucleus and uh, this is the cytoplasm. So, around the nucleus, there is a perinuclear halo giving a fried egg appearance along with the calcification common in oligodendrogliomas. You all are right. The correct answer is oligodendrogliomas. Okay. Rosettes and pseudorosettes are seen in which tumor? Rosettes and pseudorosettes. I told you rosettes, pseudorosettes. Is it pilocytic astrocytoma, glioblastoma, oligodendroglioma or ependymoma? Huh? 
rosettes, pseudo rosettes, along with the cilia, the blepharoplast, typically beautiful flower like tumor cells. The appearance, yes, it is an ependamoma. Anna, Anna, the next question is Homer right rosettes. Now, these were the rosettes and pseudo rosettes. You, you tell the answer is ependamoma. Okay, right. But Homer right rosettes are seen in options are same. What is their answer? Would you like to change your answer? HW rosettes, Homer right, right rosettes. So, in the center, there is a neuropil, the pink color neuropil. It is surrounded by small round blue tumor cells. It is seen in medulloblastoma. Yes. You get the questions like that. I know you have to take the catchy, catchy, important, important point in all the tumors. Okay. Your answer will be in front of you. All of the following are neuronal tumors except, which is, you know the classification. I told you the classification of the tumor. Which of the following is not a neuronal tumor? Gangliocytoma, ganglioneuroma, neurocytoma and ependamoma. Common sense. Ependamoma is a tumor of ependamal cells. That is glial cell, supporting cell. These all are the tumors of the neurons. That is neuronal. But this is a glial tumor. Yes, yes, yes. So, correct answer is D. Common sense. I know. Rosenthal fibers are what? Are they intranuclear inclusion body? Intracytoplasmic inclusion body? Present extracellularly or part of cell membrane? What are they? I told you Rosenthal fiber T seen in type 1 astrocytoma. That is pilocytic astrocytoma in children. What are they? Yes, they are the inclusion bodies. They are made up of GFAP protein. The pink color inclusion bodies. These are intracytoplasmic. Not intranuclear. These are intracytoplasmic. Okay, I told you very clearly. The next question, most common glial tumor. Tell me the most common glial tumor in the brain. Is it ependamoma, astrocytoma, meningioma or neurofibroma? Very easy question. Most common glial tumor in the brain. Yes, astrocytoma. In children, it's type 1. In adults, it's type 4. But astrocytoma is the most common brain tumor overall. So, correct answer here is B. Okay. Next question. Rosenthal fibers are made up of what? What is the composition? Are they made up of heat shock protein? Are they made up of fibrillary protein? Are they made up of GFAP? Anna? Glial fibrillary acetic protein? Or are they made up of globulin? What is the correct answer? What is the correct answer? Rosenthal fibers? Yes, of course. They are made up of GFAP. These are intracytoplasmic inclusion body made up of GFPP. You can see how many questions are asked on Rosenthal. Rosenthal is very important. Anna? The next question, which of the following is true about pilocytic astrocytoma? Are all except, I mean, which of the following is not true for pilocytic astrocytoma? Pilocytic is grade 1. Anna? So, is it having long survival? Total surgical resection is possible. It involves posterior fossa and it presents the age group is 80 years in old age, which is wrong among them. Which is wrong. Yes, Monica, absolutely right. It never occurs at 80, 80 age. It occurs in children, usually up to 5 years of age. It never occurs in old age. Rest of the three are correct. It is having very good prognosis. 100% surgical, surgical resection possible. Prognosis is also very good. Survival is also very good. It occurs in cerebellum. So, posterior fossa is also good. But it no, don't occur in old age. Yes, it occurs in children. Absolutely right. The next question. Most common cerebellar tumor in children. Tell me the tumor of the children which occur in cerebellum. Is it astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependamoma or peanut? Hmm? A question with a twist, a little bit twist. What is the correct answer? Yes. What is the correct answer I am asking? Yes. Yes, the correct answer is astrocytoma. Which astrocytoma? Type 1. What is the name? Pilocytic. What does it contain? Rosenthal. What is the prognosis? Huh? It's very good. So, that is the most common tumor, the brain tumor in children. Although medulloblastoma also occur in cerebellum, but it is not that way common. They are asking the common. So, answer is astrocytoma. Yes, very good. I know. We get many questions on that. Most common tumor of the lateral hemisphere of brain. Lateral hemisphere means cerebrum, not cerebellum. I am asking most common tumor of the cerebrum. Is it astrocytoma, meningioma, ependamoma or medulloblastoma? What is the correct answer? Yes. So again, the answer is astrocytoma, but this time it is GBM. They are asking for adults. I know. So, GBM. The next question, which of the following carcinoma most frequently metastasized to brain? Tell me the name of the cancer which metastasized to brain as a secondary. Is it carcinoma of the lung, prostate, rectum or endometrial? I told you in the brain, the secondaries are more common as compared to primaries. The secondaries are the metastatic tumors in the brain. So, which tumor is more common in the brain? I am asking. Yes, the correct answer is lung cancer. Lung followed by breast. So, lung cancer and breast cancer are more commonly metastasized to the brain most commonly. Got my point? The next question is in front of you. Which of the following is true about medulloblastoma? Which of the following is true about medullo True statement for medulloblastoma. It is seen in 50 years of age. It is radiosensitive tumor. Huh? Only treatment is surgery. Hmm? And uh, seen in anterior cranial fossa. 
So what is the correct answer? Huh? What is true? Uh, okay. I guess uh, skip this question. Multiple options are there. Let it be. Let it be. It was uh, yes. Most common site of medulloblastoma. This is the better one. Can you please tell me what is the most common site of medulloblastoma? Is it cerebellum, pituitary, cerebrum, pineal gland? I told you very clearly. So yes, it is also occurring in cerebellum, like type one astrocytoma, pilocytic astrocytoma. That's all about. Anna. So we are done today. We have completed the complete breast cancer and the complete brain tumor. Anna. So we will be slow, but we will cover the topic completely. Are you satisfied with the two topics we have completed today? The breast tumor and the brain tumor. Right. So the rest of the tumor I will cover in more episode. I will plan more links like I have to uh, end the session now. But after that, the lung cancer. Okay. And uh, liver, the kidney uh, and uh, the hemato-oncology, all the bone and all the genital, the male genital and female genital. These many tumors are still remaining. So I will plan more links and uh, episodes. I mean, this is episode two. So episode three and four, I guess two more episodes or three more episodes will be required. And all these tumors I'm going to cover soon. Anna, uh, so if it is, is it useful for you? If it is useful for you, don't forget to write in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe the YouTube channel. Anna, uh, don't forget to put a like, hit the like button and let me know. If you have any doubt, please ask the doubt on the telegram channel of the prosium you can ask Anna, and the further links of the oncology will be shared only on this uh, youtube channel only that is prosium youtube channel okay so if you have any other doubt you can ask me okay thank you so much thank you so much for uh, uh, giving your precious time to me and you can you are always open for the suggestions if you want any other topic in the pathology or the oncology from my side which i have enumerated right now apart from this kindly let me know we can arrange a free session on that if many students are demanding the same we can definitely arrange the free sessions on that thank you so much thank you so much i would like to end the session bye bye wishing you all the best god bless you bye bye